Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, chair of the Immigration Committee here in the New York City Council. Today, the, committees, uh, the Committee on Immigration will hold an oversight hearing entitled Supporting New York City's Dreamers uh, and our DACA Youth. The committee will also hear resolution number 1484, a resolution calling upon on the state and the federal government to extend protections for undocumented youth by passing the New York State Dream Act of 2017 at the state level, as well as the bar removal of individuals who dream and grow our economy bridge act of 2017 at the federal level. As you know, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and so many of you here today and at home listening. I have been a champion for our undocumented youth and our young adults. Dreamers deserve the right to attain the American dream, and it is our job, our collective job as a city of New York, to ensure that these hardworking youth and young adults are supported every day at every step. Before going any further, I'd like to recognize uh, council members who are here today. There's a few hearings. Uh, council members on the committee will be coming in and out, but we do have with us from Queens, council member Peter Koo. Thank you for being here. The term dreamer is used to describe young undocumented immigrants who were brought to the United States as children and know this country, this state, and this city to be their home. Dreamers assimilate to America, American schools and internalize American beliefs. Often they do not know that they are undocumented until they try to get a driver's license or cannot get a summer job because they lack a social security number. In the U.S., every child is entitled to free K through, th K through 12 public education, regardless of race, nationality, native language, gender, or immigration status, and is free to enjoy an education without the fear of unlawful discrimination. Unfortunately, federal law requires that applicants for financial aid be legal residents. So undocumented students, including DACA grantees, are not eligible. As a result, roughly 65,000 undocumented youth graduate from the US, from US high schools with little hope of attending college simply because they cannot afford it and are ineligible to receive assistance with financing. More than 4,500 undocumented students graduate from New York State high schools each year, yet only five to 10% pursue a college degree due to tremendous financial obstacles that they face. Without access to federal tuition, assistance, scholarships, grants, or loans, these bright students, these bright stars, our dreamers, are left in limbo with few opportunities for advancement. As new jobs increasingly demand advanced skill sets, it has never been more critical to ensure that all students have the opportunity to continue their education and gain that practical experience. At the state level, Assemblymember Francisco Moya reintroduced the New York State Dream Act in January of this year. It is the fifth year this legislation has been introduced now. More than ever, it's time to make sure that this becomes law. The New York State Dream Act would increase access to various forms of financial assistance for eligible immigrant students and the children of undocumented immigrants, including the Tuition Assistance Program, Higher Education Opportunity Program, Collegiate Science and Technology Entry Program, and Educational Opportunity Program. Additionally, it would create a fund which would raise private dollars for scholarships to college-bound children of an immigrant parent. The New York State Dream Act would further eliminate barriers for immigrant families to save for higher education expenses by allowing them to open a New York State 529 family tuition account under the New York State College Tuition Savings Program. At the federal level, the Bridge Act was reintroduced by Democratic Senator Dick Durbin and Republican Senator Lindsey Graham earlier this year. The Bridge Act would allow dreamers to apply for temporary deportation relief called provisional protected presence and work authorization for a period of three years with the possibility of renewal. 
Youth eligible for this relief would include DACA grantees, as well as dreamers who meet DACA eligibility, even if they never applied for DACA status. This inability to develop young talent and benefit from their ideas, their passion, their commitment to our local city cities, including New York, their strong work ethic, their energy, this is a huge loss for us in our communities and our economy. Investing in dreamers to help them attend college and reach their full potential is not only the right thing to do, it would also result in strong and in return of investment. Studies show that in New York, workers with a college education pay $3,900 more in state and local taxes compared to workers with a high school diploma. By investing in dreamers, New York can continue to be one of the largest economies in the world, as well as remain a leader in immigrant rights while reaping the benefits of increased economic productivity and increased tax revenues. This is the right thing to do. In other words, an investment in the higher education and professional success of our undocumented youth is an investment in New York State as a whole. With our path to legal immigration status or a meaningful opportunity to continue their education and professional development, dreamers are forced to remain living in the shadows. You're going to hear from our youth today who will talk to you about how this has changed their lives. The passage of the New York Dream Act would allow students who are in New York as residents, regardless of their status, to have equal access to various forms of financial aid so that they can pursue that higher education. The Bridge Act would provide temporary deportation relief and work authorization for dreamers, and in doing so would fill the gap created by congressional inaction on comprehensive immigration reform. Now, I know we're all responding in so many ways, especially the city of New York, to what's happening on the federal government. And so we're really happy you're here today to continue that resistance. But until that happens, we need to bring relief now. So in if, if enacted, the benefits of these pieces of legislation would greatly improve the quality of life for undocumented youth and young adults residing in New York State, as well as the impact to their families. It is clear that an investment in New York's dreamers is an investment in New York's future. And I'll say that again. An investment in the dreamers is an investment in the future of our state and our city. And it is time to end the state and federal government's inaction when it comes to legislation that supports our immigrant youth. And we're so happy to be here talking about this issue. This is the first time that we've actually had this conversation in the chambers. And so we're really happy to be focusing on this future, our youth. Buenos días a todos. Yo soy concejal Carlos Menchaca, el presidente del Comité de Inmigración del Consejo Municipal de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Hoy el Comité de Inmigración llevará a cabo una avanza pública de supervisión de apoyando los dreamers y los jóvenes que tienen DACA aquí en esta ciudad. El comité, el comité también escuchará la resolución uh, 1484, una resolución que pide el gobierno estatal y federal que apoya no nomás el DREAM Act, pero también el Bridge Act de 2017. Y con eso, vamos a empezar. With that, we're going to start the public testimony. And first, we're going to bring out a panel of four members of our community. And so we can have with us today Cesar Vargas, Ivan Golman, Rodrigo, Rodrigo Camarena, and Janet Perez. If you, can, if you can sit right here. We'll begin with the first panel for testimony. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Your courage, your inspiration is, uh, is what we're here not only to talk about, to better understand and to really set the tone, not just for the city and the state, but also the federal government. And we'll start with Sassad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On February 3rd of 2016, I had the, one of the most amazing moments in my life. I was in a gilded courtroom, and I was being sworn in as an attorney. My mom was to my right, my family were to the right, and, and the presiding judge who was giving the swearing ceremony testified to his own personal immigrant story. Uh, on that day, I became the first undocumented op to be openly be admitted in the great state of New York. And 
And where that achievement was made possible, not just by myself, but because of a great support system that really came along, my family, but also the nourishing educational environment that New York City provides, that New York State provides. And the way I see this, if, if uh, the states are laboratories of democracy, cities are the creative spark for democracies. Because it is through cities that we can have amazing uh, initiatives like, uh, like the IDNYC program that the administration and the city council were able to champion. DACA was significant at the federal level, but it is through the city council that we were able to push for scholarships to ensure that DREAMers can obtain uh, quality and reliable uh, guidance counselors when it comes to information of how to go to college. We have seen forums where the city has allowed many young people to pursue their dreams in, in education, in medicine. Uh, New York City was able to lead on opening almost, 100, almost 157 professions uh, that includes not just attorneys, but nursing, uh, medicine, uh, you name it. Uh, and I do believe that I hope that I am not the last and I hope there are plenty more that will be able to be the first in many, especially in their families. As someone who's practicing law, uh, we have seen the creativeness as well as the revenue that comes from many dreamers who are working. I can tell you, I saw my tax bill and it wasn't, it wasn't fun, but I am glad that I am contributing to the country I call home to ensure that we all are contributing to uh, clean parks, to ensure that we are contributing to uh, roads that, that there's no potholes. But for me, it is the city that I call home, is the city that I'm contributing, and as an attorney, to ensure that we are preserving the rights for each person, regardless of immigration status. Because if there's anything that my mom has told me, is that the American dream is not about a fancy car or a fancy office. It is about doing your part to ensure that the doors of opportunity are open for everyone, regardless of immigration status, regardless of religion, sexual orientation, or gender, and on. So for me, this is exactly why the conversation of opening the door for dreamers in New York City, but ensuring that we as cities can take lead on ensuring that the federal government can have a role model here in New York City to follow. Congressional gridlock is stalling democracy, stalling progress, but I know in New York City we can open the doors for dreamers who are afraid, for dreamers who want to be able to pursue an education but think it's not possible. I am a testament of New York City creating an environment that made this possible, and I think that we, were able to, we, were, we are going to be able to do this again for many, many young people, American kids, regardless of where they were born. And so thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to testify. And we hope that through your leadership and the leadership of the administration, we can continue to lead in New York and the, around the country. Thank you. Thank you. And we are also proud of your work today and your testimony. Thank you. Ivan? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Ivan Guzman, and I was born in Mexico City, brought to the U.S. when I was 15. I was able to pursue a bachelor's degree in political science and economics. And I strongly believe that uh, immigration is a, is a part of the country that cannot be forgotten, but also something that we must overcome all of us together here and all across the country. I believe that dreamers are an engine of progress, and an engine on economic progress that cannot be stopped and shouldn't be stopped by great luck in Washington, D.C., and also here in New York. I believe that dreamers are making progress, and I also believe that dreamers, by pursuing higher education, are, are contributing to this city and also to the economic growth of the U.S. I believe that Mr. Menchaca's leadership is helping us a great deal in achieving this kind of progress, but I also believe that we can always do more when it comes to giving more opportunities to young people to pursue higher education and to con contribute to the country that, as, Carl, um, as uh, Cesar Vargas says before, uh, we call it home. And the opportunities are limitless. I believe that we can always achieve 
more if we get higher education and if we get the opportunity to get scholarships, get grants, get student loans that are not open to DACAs or DREAMers since we don't have a legal status, quote unquote. I think that by allowing DREAMers to pursue higher education and get all those kind of benefits, the engine of economic progress in the U.S. and all across the 50 states can always continue by creating more jobs, creating more revenue, taxes are going to be paid, driver's license are going to be obtained, cars are going to be bought, buy or bought, and also people can buy houses and invest in businesses as myself. I actually opened a business about a year ago. I opened a restaurant in the Upper East Side, and we are hiring people. We're creating jobs and also tax revenue for the city. Thank you for this opportunity, and I hope that I can come back and testify here again. Thank you. Oh, you'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, man. Hi. Um. Sorry. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Janet Perez. Um, I'm here uh, with Mixtec Organization staff team, um, and also um, kind of to talk about my experience um, organizing. Um, so I am undocumented. I was brought here when I was uh, a baby, basically. I grew up all my entire life living in New York City, um, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf, I guess, on my um, college experience. Um, so, it breaks my heart that seven years ago, our federal legislator fell out, failed us with the failure of the Federal Dream Act. I remember watching closely with my family in the living room as the counts um, went by. By that time, seven years ago, I had already built a relationship with other fellow undocumented youth um, who fearlessly and in a brave manner claimed that they were undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. Um, despite the anti-immigrant rhetoric and despite our parents' fears, we uh, fervently uh, pushed for our rights to be um, recognized in a country that didn't want to. Um, so I am forever grateful for spaces like the New York State Youth Leadership Council where, we, where they centered the voices of undocumented youth and whose leadership um, saw no limit in the agency of undocumented youth and their organizing. Um, so with the, federal, federal, with the failure of the Federal Dream Act, a year later, we created a bill, which Cesar Vargas was also part of that, um, where the New York Dream Act was created in a way that met our needs. And at that time, they called us crazy. They called us, you guys are never gonna get this pass. You guys are asking for too much. But even though years later, we are still organizing, we are still asking for this uh, New York Dream Act, we have made a lot of groundwork and progressive work um, throughout the, the state. Um, so with that said, as a past college student, I know the struggle of paying for tuition. And on top of that, since DACA was enacted, we not only have to worry about tuition expenses, obviously transportation expensive, but on top of that, every year and a half, we have to worry about our DACA renewal fees, which right now is $500. And on top of added uh, with all of that cost, it is making it harder for undocumented students with no form of tuition assistance to get through college or to even start. Um, so with that said, we need the, the New York Dream Act to pass. It is not a political game for us, it is our lives that you guys, that we are dealing with. And if the federal, well, if the New York Dream Act passes, it is gonna help a lot of undocumented students who have no idea where to start or how to pay for college tuition. So with that said, we do need uh, so we do need to pass the New York Dream Act um, and stop playing games with our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. 
Good morning, Chairman Menchaca and Committee Member Ku. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Camarena, and I have the honor of serving as Board Chairman and Interim Executive Director of the Mixteca Organization. I'm here with my colleague, Janet Perez, who leads Mixteca's immigrant advocacy efforts. Uh, Mixteca, for over 17 years, has been a place of refuge and empowerment for thousands of newly arrived New Yorkers. In 2006, Mixteca helped over 5,000 individuals access critical uh, life-saving information and resources, from delivering Spanish language preventative health education to domestic violence prevention, services connecting undocumented youth to legal services and educational opportunities. Mixteca works to bring vital information and resources to community members afraid or untrusting of traditional ser social service providers. Um, for over six years, the New York Dream Act has been a priority for New York's undocumented families, and in particular, undocumented youth most impacted by the lack of access to the state's tuition assistance program. I'm proud to be accompanied in this chamber by members of the New York State Youth Leadership Council, Janet being a former member, uh, who really worked to introduce this bill in 2011, from carrying out civil dis disobediences to walking to Albany uh, from New York City. Undocument undocumented immigrants have put their bodies on the line time and time again for the betterment of our communities. I've had the privilege of seeing this work up front and know that um, we wouldn't be here discussing this topic had it not been for undocumented youth advocating for it. While I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide my testimony with you today, it saddens me that nearly after six years of its, after its original introduction, the New York Dream Act is still not law in our state. The Fiscal Policy Institute estimates that there are around 3,627 undocumented students that graduate from high schools in New York each year. Um, while New York State is one of many states that offer in-state tuition to undocumented youth, who graduate from our high schools, there is still an estimated 146,000 undoc youth and, and, uh, who are currently ineligible to receive financial aid under federal and state law. This is almost 150,000 people whose lives have been put on pause or deterred altogether due to a state law that recognizes their right to higher education by offering them in-state tuition, yet stops short of providing them with all the public entitlements to make their dreams come true. At Mixtega, we work with and employ undocumented youth and know the frustration and challenges they face in trying to make a higher education a reality. These students are disproportionately from low-income households where they are the pride of their parents and siblings, and like all of us in the room, seek higher education to better themselves. As you're aware, in 2015, Governor Cuomo came out in favor of the New York Dream Act, actively campaigning as an immigrant advocate, yet his FY18 budget has not reflected his supposed support for the New York Dream Act, while his Excelsior Scholarship, or free tuition program for the middle class, has very noticeably left undocumented students out. In passing this resolution, I hope that it will remind New Yorkers that our state legislature, and in particular our governor and state senate, have offered weak protections to undocumented youth and have a poor track record of keeping their promises to New Yorkers. When it comes to federal policy, we have little hope for comprehensive reform to our, to our country's immigration laws. The federal government has heightened its scapegoating of immigrants and targeting of both undocumented and documented immigrants for deportation, including beneficiaries of President Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Undocumented individuals and mixed status families are living in a state of untold fear that makes them increasingly vulnerable to exploitation and prevents them from accessing critical services or seeking public support. At Mixteca, we've heard stories of parents too afraid to take their children to school or to regular checkups, families on the verge of homelessness who fear accessing public shelters and often prefer to live on the streets, and even expectant mothers who are forgoing visits to their doctors for fear of reprisal. When it comes to the fears of undocumented youth in higher education, the required renewal continues of DACA continues to place undocumented students' lives in limbo. Uh, while those that have been granted DACA, it's much easier to pay for college, they, they have access to employment. Uh, DACA only offers temporary protections and could be rescinded at the president's whim. As you know, not all youth qualify for DACA, and the application is often prohib prohibitively expensive for students. The recent announcement of the federal government government of the DACA program's continuation is a welcome development, but one that offers little confidence in the medium or long-term status of undocumented youth in this country. Given the fragility of DACA and the absence of a bipartisan bill that would allow undocumented youth to obtain temporary legal status and eventually apply for permanent status, we are sadly left with the Bridge Act as the only viable medium-term assurance for undocumented youth in this country. As you know, the Bridge Act would not provide a pathway to, to U.S. citizenship. It would only allow people to, who are eligible for or already have DACA to receive work authorization and provisional protection for, almost, for at most three years. While the Bridge Act's provisions are very similar to the DACA program, if the, DACA, if the Bridge Act is enacted into law, its provisions would remain in effect until Congress either changed them or repealed the law, and it wouldn't be up to executive order. This would provide more protection to applicants for provisional protected presence than applicants for or recipients of DACA currently have. 
I'd like to thank the New York City Council Committee on Immigration for hosting this hearing and listening to our testimony. Immigrant New Yorkers are facing indescribable challenges and threats from the federal government. I urge our city and state to work together to provide creative protections for our city's undocumented residents. And my colleague and I are happy to answer your questions you might have. Thank you, Rodrigo, and, and really the entire panel for, for, kind of, for speaking truth to power today. Um, I think what I'm gonna take here and really use throughout this hearing is this concept of engine of progress, economic progress, civic participation, really the, the future of this country is going to be determined about how we support our undocumented youth. And so I'm really happy that, that you told your testimony, being the first uh, to practice law, uh, opening up a business, supporting and organizing our youth, and really building infrastructure, solid infrastructure in communities like through Mixteca in Sunset Park to really build that network. That's what we're talking about. And so the city will have its opportunities to help and support, but we need the state and the federal government to respond. And so you have the commitment, not just for me, but the entire city council. And you'll hear next from the mayor's office of immigrant affairs who has been a ma massive champion energy with us in coordination to make sure that we bring those services. Uh, the only thing that I'll say is, as we continue the conversation, to move beyond education, we re really want to hear from dreamers, uh, especially this month, as we, we pull the re final report together, about other things the city has in its capacity to do to support our dreamers. Healthcare, uh, and I think Rodrigo kind of gave a more holistic approach, but healthcare, uh, participatory budgeting hasn't been an opportunity for everyone to design how uh, the city is investing in things like parks and schools and our streets, potholes to repave streets. These are all ways that everyone can kind of feel connected and really step out of the shadows. And so we're hoping to hear, if there's anything that kind of pops up now that's a city-focused opportunity that we have the power to do, we want to hear it. You have Moya here to hear it as well. So if there's anything that kind of pops up that's strong and, and clear, I want to hear it but let's bring all those that you are connected to, the families, our mixed status families, and we wanna hear from you how the city can do its part to support our youth. It's an open question, so if anybody has anything to say on that front, if not, we will continue this conversation. I do, <clears throat> I do have one. Um, okay. At least within um, my year, uh, my time being with MASA, which is a, a nonprofit organization based in the Bronx, and even when with Mixteca, um, which is now, which I'm in now in Brooklyn, um, I've seen a lot, a lot of need for uh, tenant rights organizing, uh, support with legal uh, aid for that. A lot of the or, uh, help out there usually requires a member or someone from the family to be a U.S. citizen in order to get the support. And many of our families are may not have. Um, that accessible to them. So that's something that we really, really need. Uh, we need uh, support championing for uh, housing rights and tenant rights, especially also in private um, housing as well. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up the kind of legal support uh, in services for our families, both in housing court and other courts like immigration court to make sure that we have uh, the, res the right resources to allow families to defend themselves in, uh, in eviction, in housing eviction. Does that uh, Councilman Mchaka and Councilman uh, Ku, uh, especially coming from Staten Island, um, it's a very different borough than any other borough in New York City. Um, and uh, it was the great point of touching on, on healthcare. Um, Staten Island is one of the only boroughs who does not have a public hospital. And, you know, we have, like, our, the immigrant community on Staten Island is very, uh, you know, it's when it comes to healthcare, it's, it's people are very reluctant, not only within this climate of fear, uh, within the administration of people being afraid of going to the hospital, courthouses, uh, but the fact that there is uh, only private hospitals and, you know, we have one, we had one instance in which one of the families, uh, the, one of the brothers was in a coma after an incident and uh, one of the workers pretty much threatened that if they don't get, if, if, they, don't, if they cannot provide insurance, that they might report this to immigration. Uh, so we saw that, uh, that those chances that you know, 
even dreamers, when they go to a regular checkup, you know, the emergency room sometimes is just the only way for, for people to obtain some type of health care. Uh, and education is incredibly important, but when we cannot focus in school if people are not healthy or people are, are sick. So uh, definitely, you know, within the context of health care and, and a public hospital, specifically on Staten Island, is a very different borough. And we hope that that attention can come from uh, the administration specific when it comes to uh, health care uh, for the immigrant community on Staten Island. Well, thank you for that, and uh, thank you to the panel. And I'll be calling the second panel now. And again, thank you so much. Let's keep the conversation going, uh, especially this month as we build the final report. If anything else comes out, uh, give that over to us. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Our next panel, we have the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, um, Ms. Bita. Mustafa, sorry. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, is there anybody else? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you to Chairman Shaka, Council Member Ku, and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. My testimony today will provide an overview of the work Moya has done under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio to support immigrant New Yorkers, and in particular, DREAMers, those who have received or are eligible to receive immigration relief through the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Before I begin, I should recognize the incredible partners who have helped to make this work possible. Our colleagues across the administration, community organizations, and the council who have been critical partners in our work to support immigrant youth. Just last week, we celebrated the fifth anniversary of President Obama's 2012 announcement that immigration would re relief would be available to immigrant youth across the country, country through DACA. DACA was designed to provide temporary protection from deportation, access to a work authorization and social security number for young immigrants who came to the United States as children and want to contribute to their communities. DACA requires that applicants are in school, have graduated from high school, or served in the armed forces, and meet other eligibility rules. The local impact of this program has been tremendous. New York City alone, we estimate that there are over 30,000 DACA recipients, with an estimated 55,000 more eligible. By receiving DACA, immigrant youth have greater opportunity to pursue educational and professional ambitions, as well as to contribute to the economy of our city. DACA holders are teachers, they're lawyers, as we heard from Cesar, and men and women in uniform. This temporary immigration relief has provided thousands with the opportunity to come out of the shadows, gain financial stability, and contribute to our local and national economies through taxes and higher wages. Revoking DACA would mean a $200 million loss in wages and $6 million loss in taxes in New York City alone. We will continue to call on the new administration in Washington, D.C. to provide affirmative confirmation of DACA's continuation for the sake of our communities, economy, and so many New York City residents who have benefited from this truly life-changing program. Today, I will review the work of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to support DREAMers and advocate for New York City's immigrant youth. Moya has made connection to immigrant relief through DACA a priority through our programmatic interagency and outreach and advocacy work. New York City is truly the ultimate city of immigrants, and that includes approximately the 85,000 DACA holders and DACA eligible youth I spoke of. The mayor's office recognizes that transformative impact, even temporary protection from deportation and access to work authorization can have on a young person's life. We have reflected this through a range of work to help New York City youth learn about and realize DACA status. In June of 2014, Moya proudly launched the first city advertising campaign in years geared towards immigrants, a DACA awareness campaign. I have one example of that right here for you to see. To ensure the greatest reach and impact, Moya and our partners considered potential barriers facing DACA recipients, including lack of awareness of the program, access to information, and legal support. In developing the campaign concept, content, and in order to smartly target resources, 
Moya analyzed data to identify current and DACA eligible populations and held focus groups in collaboration with Make the Road New York and Asian Americans for, for Equality. These conversations were incredibly valuable. Recommendations stemming from this focus groups impacted the messaging, the design, and the dissemination of the campaign. For example, language, language was informed by the feedback that we received, resulting in our campaign using the term Acción Deferida in Spanish in addition to DACA. This multi-pronged, multi-language campaign consisted of ads in subways and bus stops, community and ethnic newspapers and radios, as well as information cards across city agencies, in schools and consulates and more. Ads on subways and in bus shelters delivered more than 340 million impressions over eight weeks. And ads in community and ethnic media, including print and radio, reached hundreds of thousands of readers and listeners. What's more, during the life of the campaign, Moya's DACA website at the time saw a 400% increase in visits. In 2016, building on this work, in partnership with the New York State Health Foundation, we launched a major public education campaign to connect DACA recipients and those eligible to, for DACA to Medicaid and other benefits. An example of that I also have to my left. This was the largest effort by any city across the country to highlight low-income DACA recipients' potential eligibility for benefits, such as Medicaid, and to facilitate enrollment. Again, through information sessions conducted in collaboration with community-based organizations, we learned that many DACA recipients were unfamiliar with basic information about the Medicaid program and their potential eligibility for it. We learned that our target population would benefit from clear information about what health insurance was available. The campaign's visuals were designed to reflect the diversity of DACA-eligible individuals, from parents to workers to college students. The campaign also included three short video testimonials for social media that featured dreamers expressing the ways DACA and Medicaid changed their lives. Additionally, Moya has focused on outreach to DACA-eligible New Yorkers and DACA recipients, including through our DACA plus DAPA Town Hall, co-sponsored with the Hispanic Federation, Make the Road New York, and Telemundo. This event was followed by a week-long telethon geared towards answering caller questions about DACA. Throughout the campaign, volunteers fielded over a thousand calls. Moya regularly partners with our city agencies to expand our reach to immigrant youth and ensure we smartly leverage connection points with New Yorkers to highlight available services and resources. To begin, our work with the Department of Education has been extensive. DOE's Pathways to Graduation program has trained college and career staff on scholarship opportunities for DACA youth, and through the program has awarded 35 stipends for completed internships. The department, with support from Moya, has also conducted ongoing classroom level outreach to inform students about legal service events and make in-house appointments, including over 137 free legal screenings for District 79 students, wherein 67% of the students qualified for immigration relief. Application assistance for DACA and DACA renewal were also provided to students in District 79. Through Action NYC, in partnership with Fordham Law, Moya has also provided Know Your Rights workshops in schools for over 1,000 students citywide. The program has worked with high-need schools, including community schools that serve as hubs for education and social services, international schools that have a foreign-born population of over 90%, and District 79 schools serving immigrant students ages 17 to 21. Beyond our work to connect eligible New Yorkers to benefits through DACA, Moya's outreach efforts in support of the IDNYC program have included a particular focus on the young adult population, including immigrant youth and their families. One month after the launch of the IDNYC program, the city opened a location at LaGuardia Community College. The site was so successful that we stayed until December of 2016. During our time at LaGuardia Community College, our teams enrolled over 30,000 New Yorkers for their official ID. Additionally, through our ongoing partnerships with the City University of New York, Moya promoted student IDNYC enrollment by hosting a series of pop-up enrollment sites at college campuses, including Brooklyn College, Hunter College, Borough of Manhattan Community College, Queensboro Community College, and Kingsborough College. Through these pop-ups, our teams enrolled nearly 3,000 students and staff. As part of this engagement, IDNYC brought together over 30 CUNY student government leaders from several campuses for an event at BMCC to join in promoting IDNYC to their fellow students. 
Partnerships have been key to IUNYC engagement, as I mentioned. Working closely with the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, and the Administration for so Children's Services, ACS, we have targeted outreach to youth through DYCD's Summer Youth Employment Program, the largest youth work workforce initiative of its kind in the country, and through other community-based school and youth programs. Specifically, IDNYC partnered with DYCD to deliver information to SYEPU through multiple channels, such as digital material at the program's orientation and at job placement sites. Through IDNYC, we have also worked with DOE to engage with public school students and parents. DOE has been a consistent partner, regularly issuing guidance and information on IDNYC to all staff and principals, since the launch of the program, IDNYC has partnered with Pathways to Graduation to facilitate streamlined bulk enrollments for youth, and in September of 2016, IDNYC and DOE collaborated on a launch of an on-site series in local high schools. This series of pop-ups were cited at Fort Hamilton, Fiorella, LaGuardia High School of Music and the Arts and Performing Arts, George Washington Educational Campus, Francis Lewis High School, Fort Hamilton, Edward Murrow, Stuyvesant, and more. Additionally, IDNYC sent home with all 1.1 million DOE students in all universal pre-K schools, IDNYC informational materials to parents. In the course of this work, we've engaged over 100 DOE parent coordinators as well. Finally, when children in foster care have DACA or are found to have other kinds of immigration legal needs, ACS partners with immigration legal service providers, such as the DOOR, Legal Aid, Sanctuary for Families, and others for consultations and representation. The wide-ranging work of the mayor's office, city agencies, and our partners to connect immigrant youth to services would not be complete without our Cornerstone Legal Services Program, Action NYC. In 2015, heralding President Obama's 2014 Executive Actions on Immigration, Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Mark Viverito announced the creation of Action NYC. Representing the nation's largest investment by a municipality to prepare for executive action. Action NYC is the first model of its size to connect outreach, community navigation, and legal support. In, in further support of executive action, Moya has helped lead Cities for Action, a national coalition of over 150 mayors and county leaders in aggressive advocacy, penning letters to the Supreme Court of the United States, urging them to review the appeal for Texas versus U.S. The coalition filed amicus briefs in support of President Obama's executive actions on immigration on multiple occasions, in January of 2015 to the Supreme Court, alongside 120 mayors, in January 23rd of 2015 to the District Court alongside 33 mayors, and in April 2015 to the Fifth Circuit alongside 73 mayors. The coalition urged President Obama to take additional steps to support DACA recipients at the end of his administration year. While we were ultimately disappointed in the Supreme Court's decision on executive action, Action NYC moved forward to ensure that immigrant New Yorkers, including those who are DACA eligible and other immigrant youth, have access to free, safe immigration legal help. In particular, Action NYC began a strategic partnership with DOE to provide legal services directly in schools. Partnering with schools has allowed Action NYC to reach students and parents in a safe and familiar setting. Since launch in March of 2016, Action NYC has offered 86 legal clinics at over 25 unique schools, serving over 100 individuals. Action NYC has also made 87 referrals for city and social services, including IDNYC, healthcare enrollment, and English language classes. Approximately three out of 10 individuals screened were found to have an immigration benefit available. In addition, a preliminary analysis in April showed that at least 80% of those screened at schools have stated that it was the first time they were accessing free immigration legal services. In face of the uncertainty around the future of, DACA, of the DACA program and growing enforcement initiatives by the federal immigration authorities, Mayor de Blasio has made a firm call to Washington, D.C. to affirm the program will be preserved for the 30,000 New Yorkers with DACA and the approximately 750,000 nationwide. Additionally, in response to shifts in immigration policy and enforcement at the national level, Action NYC has pivoted its outreach model and has increased the scale of regular Know Your Rights forums. 
Organizers have participated in nearly 400 community workshops since, since the election. In addition, as mentioned, Action NYC in Schools has partnered with Fordham Law to deliver nearly 100 Know Your Rights workshops in 33 schools from January through March of this year, reaching 2,488 attendees. Moya recently announced an expansion of Action NYC in NYC Health and Hospitals facilities with the opening of three new sites in H&H &H facilities in Queens, Lower Manhattan, and the Bronx. These sites will provide immigration legal services and facilitate connections to health insurance and health care for H&H &H patients and community members, including DACA-eligible youth. Further, Moy has been in close conversations with private partners to serve as a citywide Know Your Rights coordinator, ensuring effective and strategic delivery of in rights information and legal service referrals to immigrant communities in collaboration with community-based organizations, city agencies, and legal service providers. We will continue to work with partners in our national coalition, Cities for Action, to fight for the continuation of DACA, which has allowed the approximately 750,000 residents nationwide to come out of the shadows. Our coalition urges the president to explicitly commit to continuing the program and building on its successes. We recognize that despite recent indications from the federal government that DACA will continue, that this is not enough. We will continue to monitor federal policy changes and ensure that the immigrant communities that we are here to serve, our colleagues and our partners, have trusted and reliable information. We continue our call to the administration to give DREAMers the peace of mind that they deserve and to commit to protecting these young people through DACA and by supporting legislation to provide them with permanent relief. We look forward to continuing this conversation with the council in the coming weeks and working with the council and agency partners, advocates, and others to do this important work. I thank you for the opportunity to testify about this. Thank you. And, uh, the first thing I want to say, uh, Assistant Commissioner, is thank you. Uh, Moya has been a, a, uh, a great partner to the New York City Council, and, and I think what I want to do is really focus on some areas that can help us understand how to continue serving the ever-dynamic nature of the, not only the federal government, but also the population itself. Um, I also want to welcome all the young people that just walked in. Uh, you are here at a New York City Council hearing on the real impact that education has to our dreamers, our undocumented youth. Uh, and I know that our, our youth in our, in our schools know uh, friends and neighbors who are undocumented. And so you're here listening, uh, listening to the city council and the administration ta and advocates and local uh, local organizers to figure out how we can actually push this opportunity to get more education to our youth who are the future. And so the first thing I, I want to say is, or ask, kind of very specifically about DREAMers and how you're really targeting, a lot of your, a lot of your testimony really spoke to the, the kind of grander vision of integration Action NYC has had for families, mixed status families. And so we also know that the DACA population has also changed. The first kind of big push came, came to us in some ways. I think yeah. we, we've been talking a lot about it. And then now, now it gets harder. There are, there are folks that will, will, will require a very different strategy. You have really outlined incredible work that you are doing, going to institutions, bringing pop-ups to schools um, of all different kinds, coming to community. Uh, into communities through cultural centers. So tell me a little bit about how Action NYC is going to focus on the harder to reach dreamer uh, population. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I think one of the things that we, um, as I said, have noticed um, in this moment is the need to get information sort of in, in the immediate into people's hands. Um, this is a time of increased fear, increased uncertainty, given what's happening at the federal level and increased enforcement. And so um, while we um, have all always started with outreach as a component of the Action NYC model, um, we have sort of expanded what those organizers are able to do, in particular their ability to do Know Your Rights workshops to uh, harder to reach communities, as you mentioned, um, and and um, think proactively about how to really get to people where they're at, 
provide them with immediate information that they might need on what their rights are and how they might respond in a challenging circumstance, and that immediately trusted referral to an immigration legal service provider. So we are thrilled to um, currently have a number of organizations that we fund to do that work. We also work with them through Moya's outreach work to think about where we need to be and how we need to be doing that work. And we, can, we welcome sort of conversations about where there might be gaps that we have not hit. <laughs> um, and we need to be kind of smarter and more strategic. But we um, often rely also on the expertise of the organizations that we fund. Atlas DIY is one of them. They work very closely. Um, with our Action NYC in Schools program. That's because they truly bring that expertise of having young DACA youth um, in their own leadership and membership and kind of can think about how we're, we're effectively targeting folks. And, and maybe one, one kind of further uh, f a follow up actually to get us further into that strategy. Are you working, so you're working with CUNY in a very real way. Are you working with any of the studies institutes, so Puerto Rican, Dominican, mm. uh, Haitian, Mexican studies programs to really kind of think about, because they, 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 they hit everybody. They don't just yeah. hit their kind of particular, yeah. um, uh, the name of the studies program. They're, they're hitting so many different students. That's right. Um, we have worked with um, the Dominican Studies Institute um, on this very question of how we're kind of reaching people in the right way. Um, we have also mo most kind of um, directly worked, I'm going to mess up the name because I don't recall it off the top of my head, but the, the kind of Docker Dreamers program um, that CUNY has and runs. Um, so we've worked with them on doing um, specific events where we're actually bringing in the youth that are part of that programming or that are DACA students um, or DACA eligible students in the university. Um, and also we've done larger forums, one that we did actually uh, with the council um, kind of immediately after the IDNYC launch at LaGuardia. I think you're going to hear some testimony today that will kind of open up new opportunities Great. and bridges with some some more studies yeah. programs that are engaging students directly that might offer that Great. that path to Action NYC. How many DOC applications has Action NYC filed to date? It's a great question, and I'm prepared for it. Give me and, and also renewals, so both kind of the applications and renewals yes, in total. For sure. Give me one second. Let me make sure I don't get the numbers wrong. I have it for you. You got it. Um, here we go, no. Can we, can you come back to that? Let me make sure I get the, the numbers for you accurately. I do have them. Ah, here we go, never mind. I have a, a helpful assistant to direct me to the numbers. So new DACA applicants last year, um, of, 398 were identified eligible, um, and then renewals. Let me just get that right. 398 mm -hmm. were were mm -hmm. eligible through the multiple screenings. That were okay. new DACA applicants, and then renewals 267, um, and that is for the work that was done at our um, CBOs, and then in schools, nine new applicants and nine renewals. And qualify the, the last set data, nine and nine. This this is from your, from what again? So the first numbers were what our CBO partners have done, and then the second numbers were what our um, school partners have done. School partners, that's and you're, you're, that's the CUNY, the CUNY partners, the no, school. No, um, so the school partnership is with Catholic Charities. Okay, thank you for clarifying sure. that. And DACA, or actually, Action NYC has an adult education initiative through DACA, and this is our partnership with the City Council. What's happening, what's the future of that in this next budget, and, um, and, and has it been terminated? Yeah, so, um, you know, at the outset with this program, um, again, sort of with the initial thinking behind Action NYC, we were responding to executive action. Um, when that executive actions did not um, go through, we had to look at sort of the structure of the programming and worked with partners to, to try to anticipate what would be the best use of the funding. 
um, we pivoted the DACA education funding based on information we were receiving from legal service providers, community partners, on what would be most useful in that moment to create uh, broader resources um, for education funding, including ESOL classes, citizenship preparation classes, et cetera. Um, so the referrals for DACA uh, eligible individuals were still there. They were still able to make the referrals to the funders, but it was broader, more flexible programming um, on the education front. Going into this next fiscal year, Action NYC has consistently seen a tremendous demand for legal services. Um, what we witnessed in the immediate aftermath of the elections in January, February, and March was a nearly 100% increase in calls to our hotline, uh, just a, a representation of incredible need. Based on that, we've made the decision to uh, take the initial course of funding that was for one year geared towards the education component um, and uh, pivot it towards legal services. Um, really kind of going to the heart of what has been the most identified need for that program. Referrals were actually quite low. Um, for DACA Ed, and we're thrilled, um, kind of in partnership with the council and others, that there is a now increased $12 million renewed funding for um, education. And so we believe that the referrals that were being made through Action NYC are still going to be able to be made through that funding. So let me just get this right. So the, uh, the current fiscal year, as we move into the next fiscal year, the through analysis and decision making that you have just presented, you're moving the adult education initiative funding towards legal services. And can you just remind us about what that amount is? Um, yes, I believe it's about 1.2 million. And that 1.2 million will go to to serve uh, the legal the legal need for Action NYC. Yes. And is that going back to into uh, what pot? So help us understand how sure. and, yeah. and and actually kind of accumulation of, of new funding streams for Action NYC yeah. and how that's going to come through what I'm assuming the CBO work that's right. that you're doing through your um, right. through Action NYC model. That's right, exactly. So we've already seen um, in the last couple of months, we've, as I mentioned, announced an expansion through hospitals, through our health and hospitals program. Um, that will continue, and what we will be doing with this 1.2 is, as you correctly mentioned, it will go to the field. Um, for increased navigation and legal services. And so the way in which we do that um, will, will likely be through a, a city's, the city's normal kind of procurement RFP process. Um, but the intention is to increase um, the number of organizations that are receiving funding to do the work on site through navigation and legal services. When can we get a report from, from Moya on the kind of larger and now what we're hearing kind of the expanding nature of budget and kind of the moves for the budget uh, that will kind of outline in full how Action NYC will in this next fiscal year operate and looking at kind of positive case outcomes from the legal side, the number of GDs obtained, uh, workforce development, all, all the all the different pieces, healthcare, all the different pieces that you're you're connecting. Yeah. We're happy to con continue kind of setting up a conversation about that. Okay, and with a full with a report. Okay, great. Um, next is the Thrive NYC program. Mm -hmm. Thrive NYC has been a kind of big uh, has had a big splash in the city of New York, and really with a. Mm -hmm. Every New Yorker should have access to mental health services. Mm -hmm. how, how has Action NYC, Moya, used Thrive NYC to yeah. connect directly to our DACA Dreamer population? Yeah, so, so important um, in this moment where there's, as I sa have said before, but can't say enough, really increased anxiety and concern um, given the uncertainty of these programs and um, increased enforcement. Thrive is so important. Um, for those who are unaware, <laughs> Thrive is um, free mental health services that the city offers in language of choice of individuals. Um, and we have partnered with Thrive to make sure that people are receiving this information. One way we've done that is in partnership with the council as well. We, we developed a one-pager that 
Moya and all of the engagement that we do as well as our sister agencies um, use that includes all the resources that are available to New Yorkers regardless of status, um, including access to emergency shelter, including um, uh, Thrive, including IDNYC, including uh, the Human Rights Commission and the ability to report um, where you've been discriminated because of your status in the context of um, housing. I wanted to make sure to say that based on what the previous panelist had, had mentioned. Um, and so in that we include the resources around Thrive um, and that's a part of every single one of the presentations that has happened um, that I mentioned, the 400 plus. Um, additionally, we've partnered with Thrive to do engagement. Um, I can speak to some of it. Uh, we've done Know Your Rights forums to get together. We've distributed approximately 10,000 pieces of literature to pri primarily immigrant communities. We participated in Days of Action together, um, one in February and another in March, um, in immigrant dense communities and in partnership with community-based organizations. Um, and we've worked directly with communities to come to meetings and give presentations and things like that. So we've done a, some amount of work through Thrive. We are absolutely interested in doing more um, and as our, is the Thrive team. So we welcome kind of collaborations and thoughts on how to do that. I think part of what we are trying to think about with, with Thrive NYC is, is how, how Thrive NYC is, is impacting our immigrant population mm -hmm. and how to, how to measure that in yep. some way. And clearly we're in a situation right now where, where we want to protect everyone, right. but we also want to understand and measure our success. Yep. So how, how are you grappling with that, not just with Thrive NYC, but big, bigger thinking on multiple agency impacts, our adult literacy case, uh, or adult literacy work, legal services, et cetera. So, um, but, but specifically on Thrive NYC, how, how are we measuring our success and the impact uh, to get data to show that we're actually yeah. impacting the, the community? Um, it, would, it would probably be premature of me to speak fully for Thrive on that question, and I'm sure I can connect you with people who have more information on the impact question, but um, we've been in conversations with Thrive as they're sort of looking at um, kind of callers that are coming in. One thing that they've done effectively is, is create a multi-language ad campaign um, to really ensure and encourage people who don't speak English that this is a service that's available to them. I'm certain that that's one of the ways that they're looking at this, but we, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's more that we can talk about in that regard. Uh, curious about whether or not people can actually call anonymously <laughs> and can, they can? Yes. Okay, great. And, and so I, I would reiterate that that's true for the Human Rights Commission as well, which is extremely important for people to know. Good, thank you. And that's something I think we can all get the word out about, about that, that kind of safety, a safety net, but yeah. allows us to kind of continue to build yeah. relationships with our, with our community if they can do that. And something that's, sorry, to, sure. <laughs> I'm gonna keep please, adding. Please, something please. that's new to folks um, that we wanna make sure is out there is that uh, we finally have through this administration as uh, early as last year, the ability for folks to call 311 and report if they're not receiving services in their languages of choice. And so we really want to encourage people, if you're trying to you know, access the commission or uh, receive public benefits or H&H &H or Thrive and you're not getting the service that you rightly deserve in the language of your preference, then we would like you to call 311 and report that so that we can follow up accordingly. Thank you, and I think I can, we, can, we can work together to send that out, to submit that. So next, uh, advocacy for some of the resolution that we have in front of us. Mm -hmm. How has this administration really pushed the New York State Dream, what's the plan on the mayor's side to push the DREAM Act, really to, to push the, the Bridge Act and respond directly to both of those, yep. those kind of but on a state and the federal level? pieces of legislation. We absolutely support the DREAM Act. We have consistently, um, and that has been an ongoing position that we've had with the state um, and with the uh, assembly. We know that it passed in the assembly, um, the session, but that it was stalled in the Senate. Um, and so, you know, we continue to uh, support and work towards the passage of the DREAM Act at the state level. Um, at the federal level, we, 
urge Congress to pass the Federal DREAM Act um, to make a permanent protection for DACA youth. Uh, you know, I, I, we recognize that in the moment that we're in, the Bridge Act is the um, one that is before Congress, and we support the uh, importance of having the discretion leave the executive branch, but have it be something that Congress has recognized that DACA youth are eligible uh, for and should have relief, but we further and continue to encourage the passage of the DREAM Act for permanent relief. Can you give us a better sense about how you're doing it? So we get, we get the frame of, yeah. of the support for the reasons. Yep. How, how is this mayor using resources yep. to pass both of these pieces of legislation? Yeah, so as I mentioned previously through Cities for Action, Moya and, the, uh, and Mayor de Blasio are one of the key leaders in working with over 150 mayors nationally and county leaders. Um, and part of that work is advocacy towards immigration reforms. Um, and some of the ways that we've previously done that through joint statements, penning letters, advocacy directly with administration officials, and um, amicus briefs continue to, to be some of the ways that we explore that work. Um, and so we, we have no interest in st slowing that down um, and continue to kind of put our, put our efforts there and our focus. And DACA in particular is a, is a key priority for us in that. And, and, and kind of a follow-up to that, what other items is, is the mayor and the, the administration in whole supporting for our dreamers or our undocumented youth? Any other advocacy that you're doing right now on the state and the federal level that you can share with us that is beyond the, the, the resolution that's calling for the DREAM Act and Bridge Act? Are there any other pieces of legislation that you're pushing right now that you can let us know that, that you're working on? Yeah, not not specifically that I can speak to or that I'm aware of. I think one thing that we, and this was reiterated by the previous panel, that we're aware of, of course, is the ongoing sort of challenge in knowing what resources are available to folks for um, scholarships and for college tuition and things like that. That's one area that we're looking at and minimally being able to provide education on this front while advocacy is also happening. And more specifically, the last panel mentioned uh, a few a few other non-educational, healthcare-related, hospital-connected issues. Um, I'm familiar with a case that was brought up in the previous panel about a uh, an undocumented mm -hmm. uh, youth, a worker uh, who was in a coma and uh, was in a private institution and. Uh, not to go too further into the case, but I guess what I want to ask is how can how is action what's the responsibility of action NYC to cases like that where where a intervention of a city agency can come in and support the family through a situation like this where they're not getting the care at a at a private institution. You heard a little bit about the, the kind of potential discrimination. Yep. How can NYC, uh, Action NYC come in and support that family uh, and, and, uh, and that person? So the first thing that I would say is, you know, New York City, one thing that we have that's tremendous is um, health and hospitals. And health and hospitals does not ask immigration status. Um, it does not matter what your status is to receive services. So I highly encourage folks who have uh, concerns about health care or health status to ensure that they um, know, rather, that they can engage w and receive services from health and hospitals. There are also tremendous um, federally qualified health centers that we have been working with um, on health services that have extremely reasonable sort of scales for individuals regardless of immigration status. And so part of the work that we do on engagement across Moya and, our, and in partnership with health and hospitals is to reiterate that, right? To, to make sure that folks know that these services are available to them. In fact, we just completed a series of uh, town halls in partnership with health and hospitals, um, and also health and hospitals issued a letter reaffirming their commitment to all New Yorkers regardless of status. 
status is neither asked for purposes of uh, delivery of service nor a qualifier. And so uh, we hope that people are aware of that, um, that they see that as a real option for them where they don't have to have the fear um, that, that clearly resulted in a tragic situation for somebody and that they're seeking those services. I also wanted to respond briefly um, to the other question around tenant harassment and to say that um, on the one hand, if you are harassed based on your status or perceived status, we absolutely encourage you to call the Human Rights Commission. That's an area of protection under the local human rights law, and we will actively investigate it um, and follow up with the individual. The other thing is that this administration has, done a tr has made a tremendous investment in the form of um, legal support for individuals in housing court, and that support is given to everyone regardless of status as well. So um, please, if you have questions on that, come to, to me, come to our office, uh, to my colleagues at DSS, and we're happy to make sure that you have that information. Is that something you're tracking as well, as far as the city, city lawyers that are going to help tenant eviction, well, and, and there's multiple issues with tenants, but is that something that you're, you're tracking as far as, as uh, specific immigration status related uh, requests? My, co my colleagues at the Human Rights Commission are, yes, in okay. terms of their investigation and cases that come to them, um, and I would be amiss to say for certain that I know, but I can imagine that my colleagues at DSS are as well. Good, yeah. good, and we can, we can follow up uh, with yeah. the commission yeah. as well to right. make sure that we have a better sense about yeah. about time right. and whether or not more of this is happening. I can tell you from, from my experience in the district that this is happening more and more. And I think you're yeah. hearing from right. uh, particular kind of districts that are experiencing massive change, dynamic changes around gentrification and other issues that are really using this as a way to push people out of their homes. Right. And, and so the commission is going to be very, very important and really working in, in tandem with you. Yes. From, with Moya, Action NYC, and our city council district offices to make sure that we right. really get the word out that this, there's relief here, legal representation specifically. That's right. Uh, I think that is it for us. Uh, thank you for, thank you. for coming. And uh, really thank you to, to your entire, the entire agency, Assistant Commissioner uh, Mustafi. But um, the work continues, and yes. so we're hoping that this summer we can really get to the bottom of some of the lingering questions, get the word out, and really this next fiscal year come out strong and make sure that people know about all the services that, that are out there Great. and really get to those harder-to-reach DACA-eligible um, DACA right. New Yorkers uh, that have yet to hear the message. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and for your work on this issue. Thank you so much. You. So next we have the... Great. Oh, and I just want to, you're going to leave a, just for uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, you're, you're leaving someone for the red duration? Great. Thank you so much for being here. So, and I also want to say thank you to uh, the young folks that were here. Uh, they were the Bronx Academy of Letters, and Principal Brandon Cardet Hernandez uh, brought them in, and so we want to say thank you for, for bringing in the young people to see City Council in action. And our Committee on Immigration. So next we're going to have uh, Marlene Fernandez from the Jaime Lucero Mexican Studies Institute at CUNY, uh, Helen Druk from NILAG, uh, Chenson Wang from Womankind, and Miriam uh, Kawanja, the, co the Council on American Islamic Relations. This is the New York chapter. And we can have you all come over here, please, and sit at the dais. Thank you. And if we can start with uh, Ms. Marlene Fernandez, please. Uh, make sure One sec. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, for having us today and for leading the Immigration Committee. Um, uh, I'm here on behalf of the Jaime Lucero Institute of Mexican Studies at CUNY. Um, the Jaime Lucero Institute of Mexican Studies at CUNY is the first Mexican Studies Institute on the East Coast, founded in 2012 preceding a decade of work by the CUNY um, Mexican Task Force at CUNY. Um, our objectives are to boost the enrollment 
of Mexican and Mexican Americans at CUNY to retain them and to ensure their graduation within CUNY. We're also focused on research of Mexicans both here in the United States and abroad. And our last and the fundamental part of the Institute is our commitment to work with community-based organizations that are advocating for the rights of immigrants here in the city and beyond. And today I'm here to talk about our scholarship program. Our scholarship program is the heart and soul of the Institute. Many of our students are undocumented and or qualify for DACA. Um, I myself am a proud recipient of the scholarship from 2012. I'm a proud graduate of the CUNY system from Lehman College. Um, currently I work for the Heimlich Center Institute of Mexican Studies as the community outreach coordinator where we coordinate uh, two hubs, one working out of mid-Manhattan and the other one out of Sunset Park in Brooklyn where we provide uh, our clients with information to connect them to the best educational opportunity for them. And today I'm here representing uh, the, our clients and also our scholarship recipients who are, as I mentioned before, completely undocumented some and some who are recipients of DACA. I myself am a ben beneficiary of DACA and I am here to testify upon how this has changed many of the students' lives, our scholarship opportunity. Um, I'm also a founding member of the Lehman Dream Team back when I was in college. It's the first student-led club to advocate for the rights of undocumented youth in this nation. And I must remind the city council members present that in 2012 there was a walk to Albany from New York City in which participants walked over 100 miles to pass the New York Dream Act. I was one of those participants. I still remember the blisters on my feet from those long miles of walking. Um, we're gathered here five years later still discussing the importance of passing the New York Dream Act. More than ever, it's time to move forward with the proposed legislation and move away from the continuous discussion and no action. New York has indeed fallen behind in providing access to higher education for immigrant students. To all those who are here as representatives, I urge you to take the time to meet the youth who are here, to make meaningful connections, to understand that this is a real issue that our city is facing. It's time to begin to understand the complexities of what it means to be an undocumented immigrant in the United States. Undocumented students come from a diverse background. Many of them face a variety of barriers in addition to their immigration status, such as being the first generation student to attend college, low socioeconomic status, poor access to adequate housing, lack of access to healthcare, and the constant fear of de deportation of themselves or loved ones. Through the stories of these youth, you will hear the struggle, the anxiety, and the fear that many have had to overcome to reach their dream. Many who are still in pursuit of the American dream, regardless of the odds against them, our scholarship program is living proof of the potential that undocumented students can reach when they are funded. More often than not, these students do the advers adversity that they have, they have become the best at succeeding with very limited resources. Under these harsh circumstances, they have been themselves forced to be creative, innovative, ambitious, analytical, and with intense strive to tackle many of the issues that we face today as a country, as a nation, as a city. Many of our scholarship recipients have gone on to work for prestigious institutions and companies. They are all in one way or another leading change in our community. Every year we receive more applications than the previous. This year alone we received over 200 applications. Due to funding we're only able to grant 44. Most students who seek our scholarship are counting on it as the only means to pay for school. But what happens to those who are not fortunate enough to obtain a scholarship? These students are forced to decide between going to school and work. Scholarships are only able to help a small percentage of students. They're a band-aid solution to the problem. Having legislation in place would allow undocumented students to continue their educational path just like their U.S.-born peers. Furthermore, through my job as an outreach coordinator, I have seen our students struggle to manage work, school, and family responsibilities, even when having the scholarship. I have seen other students who are our clients choosing between school and work, oftentimes delaying the start of college, taking breaks to save for the next semester, oftentimes never returning to finish a uh, their higher education. The most admirable students are those that continue to pursue a college degree and are currently in school who do not qualify for DACA. These are the students that are at even higher disadvantage. They are even more vulnerable. We cannot continue to close the door to a better future. We cannot continue to be selective. And we cannot continue to push and advocate only for DACA students. We must advocate for all undocumented students. We need, a, we need state and city legislation to close the gap. Students should not have to choose if they can afford to go to school. We cannot let this talent go to waste. Our city, our state, our nation demands that we open the doors to higher education for all students. Education has always been seen as the great equalizer. Equal access gives everyone a chance to succeed. 
We hope that you will see the value in contributing to the funding and protecting of undocumented students. At the Institute, we see education as the key to socioeconomic mobility. We see it as the leadership and the driving future of tomorrow. CUNY has often been referred to as the engine of upward mobility as a poor man's uh, Harvard. By supporting all students in all ages and of all abilities, the city is making an investment in the future of our great city and of these United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, um, my name is Helen Druck, and I'm a senior staff attorney at NILAG, um, which stands for New York Legal Assistance Group. We're a nonprofit law office that's dedicated to providing free legal services to low-income New Yorkers. NILAG serves immigrants, seniors, homebound, families facing foreclosure, renters facing eviction, low-income consumers, those in need of government assistance, children in need of special education, domestic violence victims, persons with disabilities, patients with chronic illnesses, low-wage workers, low-income members of LGBTQ community, Holocaust survivors, veterans, as well as others um, in need of free legal services. Uh, we support the resolution 1484, which calls on the state and federal government to extend protection for undocumented youth by passing the New York State Dream Act of 2017, uh, as well as the Bridge Act of 2017 on the federal level. Uh, and we applaud the City Council for its continued work to protect the undocumented New Yorkers. Um, we at NILAC have been a longtime proponent of the Dream Act and advocated on behalf of, behalf of the Dreamers for many years. Since 2012, NILAC helped over 2,000 young people to apply for DACA and renew their status. We have firsthand knowledge of how beneficial this program has been for DACA recipients and their families. DACA status allows young people um, who are brought into the United States as children to move out of the shadows. With DACA status, undocumented people can get social security number and driver's license and get a job that will provide benefits. Uh, according to the number of studies, DACA recipients have significantly contributed to the economic growth uh, of this country. As of today, hundreds of thousands of young undocumented New Yorkers are denied the opportunity to gain access to higher education. Without a college degree, the students are far too often forced into the shadows of poverty and desperate existence. The proposed resolution will give undocumented youth educational and economic opportunities that in turn will yield economic benefits for New York State. In the absence of comprehensive immigration reform, and the uncertainty about the DACA's future, it's unfortunately still uncertain. Um, NILAC strongly supports the City Council call for Congress to pass Bridge Act of 2017. This bill will enable almost one million undocumented youth to live and work in the United States without constant fear of deportation. We enthusiastically support Resolution 1484 and encourage the Council to pass it as soon as possible. And once again, I would like to thank the committee for holding this hearing today and for their commitment to protecting New York City immigrants. Thank you. Thank you. Aouz Billah min shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good morning, everyone, and greetings of peace. My name is Miriam Kowaja, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator for CARE New York, that is, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, the New York Chapter, a leading Muslim civil rights organization. At CARE New York, we provide free legal services to victims of hate crimes, discrimination, and harassment, and generally support people who are victims of, uh, whose civil rights have been infringed upon. Um, today, we speak in support of, the resolu of Resolution 1484, which calls on Congress to enact the Bridge Act and on state lawmakers to pass the New York Dream Act, um, both, act, both uh, legislation which, support, which supports undocumented, uh, undocumented people here in New York um, and throughout the country. <laughs> Um, I will briefly address both of these and try to focus on the particular community we serve, which is the Muslim community here in New York City. Um, so firstly, we do believe that the Bridge Act provides certain protections and despite its limitations, it is especially important now where the Trump administration, as we've seen, has been arresting more undocumented, uh, undocumented immigrants. Um, the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement has, has 
doubled the amount of people that they've arrested this year compared to the same time period in 2016. And many of these people who are detained are like those that we hear today. Uh, they're law-abiding Americans, they're exceptional leaders in their community, and under DACA, they're predicted to grow our economy by $230 billion over a 10-year period. It seems that our president has also heard this because um, this past Friday, I'm sure many of you know, I'm sorry, uh, it appears that um, President Trump conceded to the importance of DACA and has agreed to extend the program. But I want to be clear, this is a volatile president and his word is not enough. New York's dreamers need the Bridge Act and other acts to ensure that their rights will be protected going forward. Um, moving on to the Dream Act, uh, Council Member uh, Men uh, Menchaca and I have the same statistics, uh, but I, I guess it bears repeating. Um, currently in New York City, 4,500 4, undocumented immigrants who graduate from high school each year, of, of those uh, 4,500, only 5 to 10 percent go on to college. Now, this is problematic when we remember that by 2020, 65 percent of all U.S. jobs will require a minimum of a college education. And further, in New York, uh, college graduates on average, uh, college graduates on average make $57,000 more per year than high school graduates. And this is much higher than the national average, which is $30,000. Now, the New York Dream Act ensures that undocumented immigrants do not remain excluded from these opportunities. For CARE New York, these laws are essential in supporting the, the many undocumented Muslim New Yorkers who find their situation complicated by the extensive and targeted surveillance of the Muslim community by law enforcement. As noted in Ziegler v. Abbasi, which is currently in the U.S. Supreme Court, over 700 undocumented Muslim men were detained for months before they were deported back in, I believe, 2002 and 2003. And with NSEERS, which is the National Security Entry and Exit Registration System, a de facto Muslim registry at the time, we saw more than 60,000 men from Muslim-majority nations detained and over 13,000 deported. Now, as someone whose father had to register with, this, with NSEERS, I can attest to the fear that these programs cause to particular communities. Furthermore, despite the fact that Muslims make up 95% of the investigations for political and religious, uh, political and religious inves investigations conducted by the NYPD, Surveillance is not just a Muslim problem, and it's something that will affect undocumented workers as well. The NYPD's deployment of highly intrusive technologies such as military-grade X-ray vans and cell, cell phone surveillance devices known as stingrays create a great risk for undocumented New Yorkers. The information collected by this technology could potentially be subpoenaed by federal, federal authorities, including ICE, and used to track down undocumented immigrants for detention and deportation. If this is the case, New York cannot truly, cannot truly claim to call itself a sanctuary city, and for this reason, CARE New York continues to support the Council's passage of the POST Act, which would ensure that this Council has the ability to oversee the NYPD's news, uh, use of new and invasive surveillance technologies. I commend this committee for its leadership on these crucial issues and the broader fight for the safety of undocumented immigrants, and I look forward to working with this Council and advocating for the rights of immigrant New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson and committee members and everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Chen Shen Wen, and I'm an advocate at Womenkind, formerly known as New York Asian Women's Center. We would like to first thank you for your continued support of, of ensuring the services for immigrants, including survivors of gender-based violence, are a priority. Womenkind works with survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking to rise above trauma and build a path to healing. We bring critical resources and deep cultural competency to help Asian communities find refuge, recovery, and renewal. We provide culturally matched direct services to survivors in 18 distinct Asian languages citywide. Womenkind feel, feels met uh, nearly 2,000 first time helpline calls annually. Our services include 24-hour multilingual helpline, crisis intervention, safety planning, and emergency transitional health housing, financial literacy and empowerment, education and employment assistance, children and youth services, ESL touring, and immigration legal services. Our resourceful advocates expertly navigate issues of language access, cultural norms, and trauma within the city system to ensure survivors receive the help and support they want and deserve. Annually, we serve over 1,000 survivors, most of whom are immigrants. Womankind has worked with survivors who were applicants and beneficiaries of DACA since July 2013. Many of the individuals whom we work with 
with this close survivorship of domestic violence, sexual violence, and, or human trafficking. We were then able to assist the survivors with applying for U visa, T visa, and VAWA. The majority of the youth we work with did not make an intentional decision to leave undocumented. They desire to contribute and thrive in the only society they know. Yet this youth continue to endure what feels like a punishment for decision that was in most cases not theirs to make. Compounded with other barriers such as weariness of authorities, lack of knowledge about legal rights and available support, and limited service resources in the community. Survivors feel trapped in their circumstances. We conduct dugout targeted outreach to immigrant communities who are often further isolated from service resources by barriers such as language and fear of deportation are also assessed. The impact of fulfilling immigration relief needs goes deeper. A year after deportation relief became available to undocumented youth, analysis started noticing a trend that Asian immigrants are not proportionally applying for DACA. Asians compromise and estimate 6% of the eligible DACA population, but of the total 552,240 applicants who apply, they compromise only 4%. Asian youth face unique cultural barriers when it comes to applying for DACA. Asian cultures highly value family loyalty, which inspires reluctance in Asian youth who fear authorities might locate their immigrant family. Recent immigrant enforcement tactics have caused survivors to be more fearful of seeking even our agency's services. Our advocates have also experienced difficulty in learning about survivors' immigration status. They do not want to share this information for fear of navigate repercussion. This in turn prevents us from connecting them with services, including our in-house immigration services that could help survivors to obtain status and work authorization and free themselves from their abusers and exploiters. Finally, these tactics have also enabled certain individuals to prey on survivors and other undocumented immigrants by conning them into filing fake or weak applications for asylum or other relief, or paying for motions to reopen with very low likelihoods of success. We stand alone with you and many service providers here today to call on the state and federal government to extend protections for undocumented youth by passing the New York State Dream Act of 2017 at the state level, as well as the Bridge Act of 2017 at the federal level. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your testimony. I have some follow-up questions for each and every one of you. Um, and thank you, thank you again, General, for your powerful testimony and commitment to our community. Many of you are living, living examples of the kind of impact something like DACA and other services have had, have had on you and your, um, and your neighborhood and your city as well. So we're just thankful that, that you're here to testify. Um, Ms. Wang, I, w I have a question for you specifically with Womenkind and how we can reach specifically young immigrant uh, survivors of, of, of crime. And there's multiple crimes that you, you've, you've alluded to here. Is there a way that we can, as a city of New York, and, and you kind of gave us a, a real good sense about, about the, the issue that we're experiencing, but I, I'm kind of curious from you about how the city can do more specifically for that population. Um, for me, as an advocate, I have clients who express um, fear because of their immigration status. I think for the city, I think education is also very important. Like um, a lot of immigrants, they are not aware of their rights, and especially due to language barrier. And there's a lot of um, a myth that's in the community, that especially with the current political climate. So that's one of the things that. I'm going to do a follow-up with that and also welcome uh, from Brooklyn, Councilmember Matthew Eugene, uh, who's on the committee as well, and Councilmember Drum, who came in earlier. Now, 
there's a there's a real disconnect, and this is something that I have continued to say over and over again, and con and and also implemented in the work that we do as a city council and me as a council member representing a very large and emerging, uh, ever growing uh, Asian population, specifically Chinese families in District 38, and in Brooklyn, and how how do we how do we work together to kind of build those bridges? And, and really my, my specific ask of, of you is to think about what are we not doing or what can we do more of to really build that relationship with our, our, our uh, specifically Asian youth, working with them in their schools or in churches or in for specifically, for example, my district office where we have folks who come in uh, my, my office, we have multiple languages spoken that are reflective of the community. Tell me a little bit about how, how we can do that better and if those things are working right now to engage uh, our, our Asian youth. Um, I, um, I don't, um, my clients are not like, um, a lot of them are not um, youth. I mostly work with um, mothers of the youth, but um, um, Maybe I can bring these um, questions back to our youth uh, advocates because we do have a, a youth, um, uh, our uh, youth uh, star poke ch uh, uh, children's program that provides children and youth services. So they have they are more knowledgeable about like the youth and um, uh, what's the best for um, for the city to connect with the youth. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I'm sorry that I don't have the answer right away. No, that's okay. And this is this is a dialogue. So this is this is part of how we can work together to really kind of build that um, both accountability at the off, uh, at the administration side, but also really take in ideas from from you who uh, and the organizations and the advocates to to bring back to the city and say Look, this is what we can do. But across the board, I want to say this over and over and over again because we have to say it, or else we're not going to be able to address it. Our Asian communities are are not yet fully being impacted positively by all the things that we're doing in the city, and that is a massive concern to me, and so and to the administration. So we want to make sure that if there's anything that is working really well for us to continue to expand on, uh, and not just for youth, but for for the women that you engage, and where 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 are things working well, so that we can further support, and so we're open to the dialogue. Uh, in, in the future. So thank you. Thank you. And um, Marlene, uh, are, do you know if the program that the governor announced that would make college free for a low-income student applies to DREAMers? Right, so it's very important to know that the Excelsior Scholarship, which is promoting free tuition for all CUNY and SUNY schools, undocumented students will not qualify for that. And that's an important thing to talk about, right? And so how, how has the Studies Institute thought about responding, uh, advocating, and, and how can we help? Right, so one of the ways we're approaching the, the myth that everyone qualifies is we've developed a new workshop uh, through our Education Opportunities Initiative to approach this and really inform the community that a lot of recipients, especially the DACA ones who have the Social Security believe that they qualify for, to demystify that and to get the correct information out there. So we're working on that and adding a segment to our college uh, enrollment workshops um, to make sure that students know who are in the situation who are undocumented or have DACA that they don't qualify for this. Um, I would say at the Institute, we are always uh, fundraising and trying to increase our funds so we can provide more scholarships. Uh, every year, the scholarship program has grown. Over the course of five years, we now have over 100 scholarship recipients. Uh, we started off with one in 2012 as a guinea pig, and every year it's grown since then from 12 to 23 to 35 to 44. So an average about 10 students growth per year. Um, we hope through the support of city council to expand our scholarship opportunities program to a greater range of students that we can reach and hopefully make CUNY accessible to them. And the city council is really proud to support all the studies programs. For the first time this year, um, the city council as a whole uh, has given over $200,000 this year to the Mexican Studies Institute. And so we're really happy to continue to work with you to build that partnership and all the institutes really to make sure that we are really funding that kind of direct impact to our students. So thank you for that. And we're going to continue to work with you on, on the kind of state issue with the governor, but the New York State Dream Act needs to be passed as long as the, uh, as well as the Bridge Act. And Helen, uh, at NILAG specifically, 
How have you noticed any changes? This is a question I asked uh, the, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the Assistant Commissioner, about how things have changed now that we've really kind of engaged a particular kind of DACA population and now are really moving into spaces where it's going to, it's going to require a different strategy to take, to take, to take a different strategy to, to really bring new, the new DACA um, population. What are you seeing as, as, uh, as, as a change and, and specifically within the key to the city events that you support us on uh, in our communities? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, as you know, through the key to the city uh, clinics that we've been conducting now and working uh, together uh, with you for a number of years, we still are able to identify potential uh, DACA applicants from various immigrant communities. I mean, one of the great things about those clinics is that it, it allows us to identify people who may be eligible for various kinds of immigration relief, one of them being DACA. Sometimes we're able to identify youth that is maybe eligible for SIG, Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. So this is actually a great tool for us. As, as I've testified at previous meetings here, what we notice um, lately is the fear, the increased fear in the community, and I've heard my colleagues here you know, from the Asian community and other uh, colleagues testifying earlier, um, that even before the new administration came in, there was certainly fear always in uh, the undocumented immigrant community in New York, but uh, over the course of the past few months, this fear is clearly increasing. So if people were afraid uh, to come forward because of their families, and very frequently, as we know, DACA's uh, have parents and other siblings who may be undocumented, uh, this fear has certainly increased. Um, we provide all kinds of training, know your rights training to the community, which um, even though we're not directly doing uh, consultations at those sites, but we're just reaching out and trying to make sure that people know you know, what services may be available to them. Well, I, I, and I wonder, are you seeing a, 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 a surge in fear for renewals? Is that something that, that has kind of we, popped we up? We see this all the time, actually. What, what internally, we had a lot of discussions whether or not, you know, initially, whether or not we should proceed with initial DAC applications. So once we have identified those who, for whatever reason, have not applied in the past and may be eligible today, there was a certain reluctance again. And, and, and then we were facing this issue again with the renewals. Well, we determined internally that we should still, you know, forge ahead and go forward and advise people that it still will be beneficial to them to renew their DACA status. And we, so currently we are going ahead uh, with both the renewals and the initial applications once um, those who qualify are identified. When I wonder if that tension, in that, in that tension we can think about informing the strategy. And so I'm hoping we can sit down uh, and, and as we, we just passed the budget, we're really excited to be renewing our commitment as a New York City Council uh, and working with Action NYC and other, other um, other programs that target our, our, our DACA applications, including the, the studies program, we should all really sit down and really think about how, how, we, how we double up on the efforts to remove barriers, address the fear, and, and get, get those renewals in, and get those initial applications up and running. So thank you for, that, for the testimony, but I think, I think um, the next step is really to sit down, strategize, share best practices, and really, really make sure that we measure our success over time and not just, well, actually I'll end there, measure our success and make sure that we are succeeding in this next fiscal year. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all the initiatives and for all your work that you are doing. Absolutely. Well, you have an incredibly committed council with uh, not only our finance chair, Jalissa Ferreras Copeland, um, but also our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, and the three of us have, have been with the committee and the whole council have been your, your champions on, on all these fronts, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I have a follow-up question for Miriam, um, and really the the question here is is really thinking about our immigrant, our immigrants, uh, our, our Muslim immigrants, our Arab origin immigrants, and thinking about our students in specific um, that are kind of both 
and, and as thinking about both and multiple identities as, as we engage in services, multiple ser ser uh, services, and thinking about their immigrant status and also religion, how can we do more to support, to support them um, and, and really kind of focus in on this intersectional understanding of these students and really think about how, how multiple services, not just education, healthcare, mental health care, and if you can give us a sense about, because um, I think your testimony really addressed the, the holistic approach, but if there's one thing that we can do better as a city of New York, well, we'd like to hear that. So at work, this is a question I ask myself every day, is how, that, how can we address the issues that a lot of Muslims who are undocumented or face different forms of intersectionality, how can we support them in various ways? A lot of my concern, sorry, I'm fasting today, so I'm, my throat's really dry. Um, a lot of, I think, um, Muslim the Muslim community's concern with the state has historically been our situation with surveillance. And so you have an older generation in particular that is very uncomfortable working with state and federal law enforcement occasionally because there's that fear that this information might be taken. Uh, your younger generation, however, at least people who are my age, and not very, very young, are more willing to organize because of the environment that we grew up in. And so, honestly, I would say that if, the, if you're looking for people between the ages of like, like teenagers and their 30s, you would just have to like at first acknowledge the fact that Muslims are a very diverse group, even ethnically. We have lat like Latino Muslims, African American Muslims make up the largest portion of Muslims in the United States, and yet constantly South Asian or Arab people are considered the model Muslim when we think about, about it. So that's the first thing that we have to start doing, and that's something that we've been trying to do here at Care in New York, is that address the fact that there are a lot of communities that face a worse intersectionality being, for example, being black and Muslim is a lot more difficult than being perhaps South Asian and Muslim, and trying to address issues that exist at that intersectionality. Um, we've had Latino Muslims who were yelled at for being Latina and also Muslim, but then people don't believe that they could exist at the, at the same time. So honestly, the first thing is, uh, just acknowledging that they exist and sort of trying to pro pro uh, create programs where these people can sort of navigate and discuss the issues that they face at that intersectionality. I'm, I, I don't have more for you at this moment. I'm sorry because this is something I do think about at work a lot and it, it is quite, a, quite an extensive question. Well, know that let's continue the conversation and figure out how we can continue to, even as early as now in the summer, uh, really work together to advocate and really bring everybody together to advocate for uh, even just the awareness issue and bringing, bringing an awareness of our Muslim community and how diverse it is already. Um, I'm sure uh, the studies institutes might even help in, in kind of engaging that at the level of, of CUNY and have multiple partnerships. And, and I think a place like Sunset Park would be a perfect place to kind of launch some pilot projects and, and awareness campaigns about how diverse our communities are. And so um, I hope we can meet, uh, even exchange information today about how we can do that. Thank you. And I think that's it for my follow-up questions. Any last comments before I head over to the last panel? Okay, thank you for your work. Thank you for your courage. Uh, we, are, we are resisting every day, and all of you are really presenting that front, uh, on the ground vanguard of support and resistance to our communities, and so I just want to say thank you. We're going to continue to support you in the City Council, uh, so just keep doing the good work. Thank you. And our final panel uh, for folks here, and, and I will say th this is the final panel, but if anybody did not submit testimony, we have... Jake uh, LaRouse from Immig Immigration Task Force, the Manhattan Young Democrats. We have Lindsay Bauer from Brooklyn Defender Services. Uh, Joshiana Guaman from the Emerald Isle Immigration Center. And Sandra Pe Pe Perez, Perez from uh, NYMIC. If you can come up here. If you, your name was not called and you want to testify, uh, talk and sign up, talk to the Sergeant, Sergeant of Arms and get a slip. Otherwise, this will be the last panel for this discussion. And uh, we were joined by Councilmember Espinal from Brooklyn. Great, if we can start over here. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, Chairman Chaka and attendees. 
Uh, my name is Jake LaRosse, and I am the chair of the Immigration Task Force of the Manhattan Democrats. Uh, the Manhattan Democrats uh, are the official youth arm of the Democratic Party in, uh, in Manhattan County, uh, and we are comprised of and represent the millennial young adult Democrats of Manhattan, uh, from the progressives to the blue dogs and everyone in between. Uh, our members and leaders are all steadfastly united in supportive policies that address the problems and difficulties that young New Yorkers and young Americans face. And so we seek to champion legislation that protects and defends our rights as young adults. Undocumented youth and so-called dreamers, despite their lack of legal status, are as deserving of such protection as we are, because they are as much New Yorkers and Americans as us all, the majority having spent almost their entire lives in the United States. The Manhattan Young Democrats, like many other young Americans, recognize that the status-specific labels with which undocumented immigrants and dreamers are plastered belie the fact that they are, first and foremost, our neighbors, our colleagues, our friends, our family. They are us. A person's humanity is not given permission to exist by virtue of their legal status, and so those of us without status should not be denied service and protection simply because some have forgotten that we're all equally human. Enacting the New York State Dream Act would not only fulfill the promise of equality of opportunity that our state projects, but also inarguably be in all of our mutual interests. Every year, thousands of undocumented students graduate from high school in New York, yet less than half later enroll in college, largely because of the prohibitive cost of higher education and their inability to access most sources of financial aid. Already, New York's undocumented, youth adults, uh, undocumented young adults contribute over $140 million annually in, New York, in state and local taxes, but this rate of economic contribution pales in comparison to what they could accomplish if they were put on the same footing as their American-born peers. States that have taken measures to level the higher education playing field by giving undocumented young adults access to in-state tuition rates and financial aid have seen both decreases in, in the undocumented high school dropout rate and increases in the rate of college enrollment. Why should our state deprive a faction of its young adults of the fair opportunity to higher education and itself of the enormous benefits their unleashed potential would bring? The need to pass the Bridge Act is similarly pressing. The current state of the DACA program, and by extension the protections and benefits that it provides, is unclear, despite the few hollow promises offered up by the Trump administration. Many Republicans and conservatives, establishment and fringe alike, have kept up the call for DACA's complete termination, while anti-immigrant extremists from organizations that the Southern Poverty Law Center has identified as hate groups secure high-level jobs in the West Wing and DHS. These, these individuals' desire to disenfranchise and dispossess dreamers and other members of the immigrant community is seemingly boundless. And so our will and mettle to safeguard these protections through measures like the, Dream, uh, like the Bridge Act must be equally unfailing. In backing this bill, the Manhattan Young Democrats further recognize that the Trump administration's inhumane and frankly un-American actions and rhetoric have cast a pall over the lives of the members and the, of the immigrant community in New York and the country at large. I would thus be remiss if I did not address two additional issues relevant to today's hearing that also merit some response from the City Council. First, the Manhattan Young Democrats are disturbed by the fact that the Trump administration's draconian crackdown on the immigrant community with raids and arrests taking place in courts and, and at uh, children's soccer games and in houses of worship is perniciously targeting law-abiding immigrants without criminal records, like Diego Puma Macancela, the high school senior who was arrested by ICE just hours before his prom in Westchester two weeks ago. We hope that this body will continue to condemn these actions. Second, we're concerned uh, by the Trump administration's gutting of the availability of prosecutorial discretion in immigration court proceedings, which has been a widely accepted doctrine in the immigration context that became all the more important as our immigration courts have been inundated by a backlog that now exceeds 585,000 cases nationwide. The top-down assault by this administration on prosecutorial discretion and similar collaboration requiring procedural tools clearly demonstrates its inability or unwillingness to enact policies in accordance with fact and reality. It is exceedingly important, if not morally imperative, that our city continue to demonstrate its dedication to the protection of undocumented immigrant New Yorkers, because ours is, ours is a city inextricably tied to the immigrant experiences I know personally. My great-great-grandfather arrived in New York City in 1895 at the age of 23, became a prominent member of the Lower East Side Landsmanschaft of Bialystok Soccer Jews, and played a leading role in the planning and, and construction of the Bialystok Soccer Home for the Age in, in the late 1920s, the same building that continues to stand today after becoming a city landmark in 2013. My story is neither unique nor rare among New Yorkers, many of whom have similarly deep ties to the very brick and mortar of the city through their own ancestors' immigration journeys. It is the young who are tasked with carrying on the memories and lessons of those who came before. And so the Manhattan Young Democrats take on this responsibility now by endorsing the proposed legislation at issue today. Our shared humanity, the humanity shared with our fellow young New Yorkers who lack legal status, the humanity they share with our forebears who made the fateful decision to start their lives anew in the United States, and the humanity that will run through all of our descendants when we are gone Calls, now, calls, now calls us all to action. We must answer.
Thank you, for, uh, thank you for inviting my testimony. I look forward to working with the committee and city council on this important immigration issue and others in the future. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Buller and I'm an, a BIA accredited representative at Brooklyn Defender Services. We're a public defender's office in Brooklyn. Um, in my work, I do a variety of immigration applications, but a, I would say a vast majority are DACA applications, initials and renewals. Um, our clients come to us in kind of a unique way. They come to us through often our criminal defense practice or our family defense, defense practice. So we're sort of uniquely suited to sort of reach young people who might not otherwise be real keen to reach out to legal service providers or have access to those networks. So in a strange way, sometimes criminal justice contact can turn into a point of entry for these young people to really get legal services that they might not otherwise um, be interested in or, or know how to access. Um, we also get referrals from the community as a result of outreach that we do or various, um, some of the adult education and um, English language programs will refer to us. We've seen sort of a downtick in that lately and I don't know if that's a result of sort of a chill in the community generally or if it's a result of there being fewer of those programs available. Um, I wanted to share a story of a client um, because I think it is representative of a lot of what a lot, lot of our clients go through. Um, Sophia is 19 years old from Mexico. She's been living here since she was nine years old. Um, she came to us after she had already submitted her own DACA application with the help of a tax preparer who wasn't really qualified to help her um, and she had been denied. So we were able to help her sort of overcome the deficiencies and she was ultimately um, granted when we helped her apply for a second time and that approval came just before she graduated high school. So she's now completed her first year at, uh, let me get the name right, at Gutman Community College and she hopes to transfer to John Jay or Hunter. Um, she's pursuing an associate's degree in liberal arts and humanities. Um, and while this is a really positive development for Sophia, she is struggling to, to get by financially. She's not eligible for, fi for federal financial aid. She was explaining to me how um, some of the sort of private scholarships that are available have requirements like community service, things that she just doesn't have time for because she's a full-time student who's also working to try to pay her way through school. Um, a lot of our students also find themselves suddenly the first members of their families not only pursuing higher education but the only member of their family with lawful employment authorization. So they're struggling between this opportunity to go to school but also they might find themselves the primary breadwinners as the only people legally authorized to work um, in their families at a pretty young age. Um, so we feel that you know, young people in New York should not be forced into the role of primary breadwinners for their families and anything that we can do to help them um, qualify for financial assistance to pursue their dreams of higher education. Um, we're very much in favor of and we feel like the DREAM Act, you know, goes a long way to doing that. Um, we encourage City Council to think about how we can all work better to support college-age youth and ensure that they get the education they deserve. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up was we were talking a bit about the access to public benefits and health care and things like that. Something I see a lot is that even if people are aware of those benefits being available, there's sort of a stigma, I think, with certain communities and the idea that, no, I shouldn't apply for those things because it's going to look bad for my immigration case later. So dispelling that myth, I think, is something that we could work on with at least some communities. Um, and then the application fee. I don't know if, I think there used to be a bit more um, assistance available. At this point we can refer clients to get loans that they pay back for the DACA fees, but it's one of the few immigration fees for which there is no fee waiver available. You have to pay the fee. There's very, very small carve outs for like people who are homeless and um, very few. I've never had a client qualify. Um, so anything we can do to help because many clients find themselves in the position of renewing DACA for $500 or, you know, putting that money towards tuition or books or something else to pursue their, their dreams. So I just wanted to thank you again, um, and we firmly support Resolution 1484 and strongly encourage its adoption. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sandra Perez, and I'm the coordinating supervising immigration attorney at Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, which is also known as NIMIC. And on behalf of NIMIC, we thank you for inviting us to present our views on Resolution 1484 and passing the DREAM Act. Um, and the extended protections for undocumented youth. 
NIMIC is a community-based settlement house founded in 1979. We have grown into a leading multi-service agency with a staff of over 100 serving all of New York City. Our mission is to serve as a catalyst for positive change in the lives of the people in our community. Our legal and social services programs include immigration legal services, housing court, representation and eviction prevention, and counseling for victims of domestic violence. Our education and career services provide the community with additional tools necessary to build secure and prosperous futures. NIMIC does not charge any fees for its services, and we represent mostly low-income and indigent people um, in northern Manhattan, uh, Inwood, Washington Heights, and the Bronx. NIMIC is one of the few legal service providers available to serve the high volume demand for immigration services in Upper Manhattan. Uh, our nine-story office building is ideally situated in the heart of Washington Heights, where a large immigrant and mostly Spanish-speaking population uh, can easily access a broad range of services available. For example, a DACA-eligible client can be referred to our education services in order to fulfill the education requirement and then send back to our legal team on the seventh floor to file an application. Should this client have housing issues or facing eviction, our experienced housing litigators can intervene and preserve their apartment as they go through this process. NIMIC's Immigration Unit provides access to an extensive array of immigration services. We are designated Action NYC site in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, MOYA, uh, since the very inception of the Action NYC program. And we are very excited to partner with the city in this endeavor. Our Immigration Unit provides services ranging from preparation of applications for U.S. citizenship, family-based petitions, deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, to complex forms of relief such as U visas and Violence Against Women's Act petition, also known as VAWA. In addition to conducting daily immigration screenings through Action NYC, our immigration unit offers walk-in consultations twice a month. NIMIC also provides Know Your Rights workshops on various issues, including the protection against fraud by immigration uh, notarios. We also, have an ex we also have experienced a recent surge in the demand for consultations on the immigration consequences of criminal arrests, not just convictions, as well as many RFEs from USCIS asking for documentation on dismissals, uh, on former arrests, and on remote arrests from 20 years ago, on what used to be a straightforward application. Um, this has added substantially to the fear and the distrust by uh, prospective applicants in pursuing immigration benefits in the community. At NIMIC, we have been on the front lines in the quest of expanding DACA. Many young college-bound immigrants have relied and trusted NIMIC for assistance and representation. Our office has witnessed numerous young, intelligent, and hardworking recipients anxiously awaiting a future opportunity to obtain permanent status. Ms. Perez, can I pause you there and ask sure. just for clarification? The yes. applications you're referring to, those are DACA applications, and you're saying there's an increase? Uh, there's an increase in RFEs, and I, I apologize, requests for evidence um, through with DACA, and for example, for marijuana, arrest that resulted in um, an adjournment and contemplation of dismissal. In other words, no conviction, no plea of guilty. But not just with DACA, we've also experienced that with a, a wide range of different immigration benefits, which was not the case previously uh, unless it was a conviction or, or unless they were applying for citizenship, which it's a privilege and not a right, and so they can inquire as to the good moral character. But now we're seeing it across the board. And, and, and when did that change? We've noticed a change in the last couple of months. So, and it's, it's, it's... So this is a Trump administration? Yes. Uh, and do you know if there's anything associated to memos or any we, kind of uh, official stance that, that the administration is, is making? Our position is that this... And, and this is based on our experience or, and what we've seen, that it could be due, obviously, to the, well, Attorney General Sessions memo, um, which, you know, has the broad language and doesn't, and has vague language as well, um, and doesn't specifically say that the DACA recipients will be, uh, will not be subject definitely to, to this language. Uh, and also the contradicting language between that and the executive order where um, it speaks to any arrest 
uh, crimes, whether convicted or not, whether pending. Um, there's also language um, speaking about in the discretion of the immigration officer or acts um, which could be charged as a crime. Uh, there is so much there that even laypersons who are not privy or may not understand the language, they, they, have, they have an idea and a sense that they, things are not the way they used to be. We also have a lot of reports of clients who have traveled and even though they're let go um, and they're not subject to deferred inspection where they remove their green card and ask them to come back to the airport, um, they're held for sometimes two or three hours. They're documenting, um, they're, they're putting their information in a database at the airport. Um, they're asking them many, many questions um, and then they let them go, but they leave thinking, okay, they let me go, but what does this mean for later? So we, we also have a lot of clients who are, are really worried about traveling again or wondering if as a result of all of that documentation that was taken at JFK, um, will they be coming to my house? Will they be knocking on my door? Um, which has caused us to um, conduct many um, additional Know Your Rights and outreach and, um, and information materials for the community. Um, did you have any other? I'm, I'm I have one follow-up, and uh, I'm sorry for yes. interrupting it's the okay. testimony. I just wanted just to step yes. in here. And one, one final follow-up, and I'll come back for some more questions. The consistency, I, I want to get a sense of the consistency in, in your applications with DACA, whether or not this is something that's across the board, or, 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 or is this a kind of piecemeal approach, or are all your applications as of a couple months ago receiving this kind of scrutiny? We, we've seen it with all of our applications. Um, but the, interestingly enough, lately a lot of the, um, the DACA renewals um, who have had any arrests from the past, um, they, they are increasingly concerned and worried as to what, what, are they gonna, what will the ramifications be? And you know, will they be detained at some point? Um, you know, they're applying for uh, better jobs um, because obviously, as one of our colleagues said, education is a great equalizer, and now they have the ability to change their, their circumstances, to move up in society, um, to, get, to have a higher earning capability, and so they're hesitant now, and they wonder what, what will the future hold and how this new administration will really be treating them going down the line um, now that there's so much information collecting. And, and, and then also just for clarification, is this happening with new DACA applica applications and renewals? This is happening mostly with renewals, and, and I must say that we, we did not get hardly any renewals um, recently. I'm, not, I'm sorry, not renewals, initial DACA. Um, there was a lot of, um, there were telethons, there was a lot of Know Your Rights um, information that was disseminated. Uh, upon um, after the elections, and so I think people were um, being advised um, by many many organizations to be wary of initial applications um, due to the risk and due to the the fact that we did not know what was going to happen or how DACA would be treated. So we did we we did not have many initial DACA. So this is all happening with renewals that yes. you're submitting with an extra added review. Uh, that could be associated with the Sessions memo that came out? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the most uh, recent um, requests for evidence was based on a dismissal from Bronx County where they're asking if the case was dismissed, we need for you to provide documentation as uh, certified from the courts um, showing um, why it was dismissed and you know, clearly, and, and I can speak as a, a former prosecutor from many years ago, a lot of information is created, a lot of records are created um, when someone is arrested, which can have, initially, anyone can accuse anyone of anything. 
um, and that's why we believe that people are innocent before proven guilty. But in the interim, a lot of paperwork, which can be very damaging, and a lot of accus accusations can be um, documented, which ICE or USCIS is now requesting, even in cases of a dismissal, for proof of what happened, and they want a narrative from the district attorney's office and or the courts, which is very troubling. Very troubling. And um, and just to get a sense about, about rates of, for the renewals and applications, have you gotten positive report backs from the renewals for DACA? Are, are people getting renewed, even with this extra layer of review for? We have not, um, we have not, this is the other thing, because they're asking for so much documentation, everything is taking longer now. And so how, many how many applications have you completed for renewals at this point? At this point, we have approximately, in the last couple of months, I would say it's not a large number, perhaps 30. Um, okay, so and as a percentage of your kind of full caseload, is that, is that a small percentage? Is that, is that, Th that is a small percentage. Okay. That is a small percentage. It'd be great to follow up with you, and I, actually this is gonna allow us to kind of follow up with everybody who's doing DACA right now and figure out, I wanna go back and actually ask folks that same question. Are you seeing this? Are you noticing this? And, and where, where, are, where are we getting the, the percentage renewals? What are the percentage renewals? And then return uh, with, with, with uh, affirmation for renewals as well. This is, this is helpful for us to, to follow up with all organizations, including the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Sorry, if you want to finish, finish we, your testimony? We, yeah, we will, we, will, uh, we will be happy to provide all that information. Great. And Thank as you. I stated earlier, we're uh, uh, in partnership with Action NYC and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and we're a site. Um, so we will be happy to share that information because we also have an expanded immigration unit aside from our Action NYC team. Um, and just to wrap up, um, and, and going back to education as a great equalizer and why we stand in solidarity um, with this cause in passing the DREAM Act and uh, Resolution 1484. Um, speaking here um, before the City Council, English is my second language. Um, I am a product of um, Dominican immigrant parents. Um, my sister is a doctor. Um, we had to learn English where there was no second language um, back in the 70s. And, uh, but for those two hardworking immigrants, um, we would not have been where we are today. Um, and um, this is very personal to us because we see what an incredible difference it can make in your life. And we see by contrast what happens to those who do not have access to education living in the same neighborhood, growing up in Washington Heights, they do not have the same results. So this is something that we applaud and we are passionate about and we will be um, more than happy um, to provide any further details or information or any work that is needed to um, push this along. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your, your personal commitment to this, to this issue. Thank you. To wrap us up, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman, and Tucker, and everybody. My name is Josiana Guaman. I work at the Emerald Immigration Center, which is an organization providing immigration, social service, and employment-related services to immigrants through its office in Woodside, Queens, and Woodlawn in the Bronx. We assist more than 20,000 clients annually by providing case assistant information and referrals. EISC offers legal counseling on immigration naturalization matters to indigent immigrants and New York City residents. Over the past five years, we provided legal assistance and social services to over 100 DACA recipients. EIC would like to thank the New York City Council for the opportunity to submit the testimony regarding this legislation affecting immigrant students in New York, and especially thank Chairperson Carlos Menchaca, the Committee on Immigration in New York City Council, for the continued support to our, to our work to assist the New York City immigrant community through the Immigration Opportunity Initiatives, IOI. On June 15, 2012, the Obama administration moved the country forward by providing the nation's youth with its discretionary relief of deferred action. 
By passing the New York State Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors, the DREAM Act of 2017, at the state level, as well as the bar removal of individuals who dream and grow our economy, Bridge Act of 2017, at the federal level, New York State will be one of the pioneering jurisdictions providing youth the opportunity to reach higher education and further deportation relief. There are currently 2 million undocumented immigrant, immigrant youths living in the United States. 65,000 are undocumented youth who graduate from high school throughout the United States each year. And 400,000 are immigrant youth living in New York that will benefit from the passage of this New York Dream Act of 2017. The United States Citizenship and Immigration Services provided statistics as to the federal progress of deferred action. As of March 31, 2017, there are 1,800,000 89,311 undocumented youth nationwide submitted deferred action requests. Of that matter, 111,233 came from New, York's, from New York. More specifically, the New York Dream Act of 2017 allows all students, regardless of the immigration status, access to financial aid, such as tuition assistance program, higher education opportunity program, a collegiate science and technology entry program, education opportunity program, which is already in other community colleges. Allowing students to be eligible for financial aid also has tremendous benefit for the economy. According to the Fiscal, uh, the fiscal Policy Institute, the median earned income for a family state worker with a bachelor's degree is 25,000 higher per year than someone with just a high school diploma. The additional taxes paid by the bachelor's degree holder would amount to about 3,900 per year to state and local government, and a two-year degree would, initial, would entail a 8,000 state investment in aid, which means a maximum tap aid of 4,000 at two-year college. The medium income of a two-year college graduate would amount to about 10,000 more per year higher than a worker with just a high school diploma. The state and local taxes paid each year would also be about 1,000 higher. Thus, there is quite a huge return on investment for the New York, for the state of New York. Further, if New York allows all of its students, both documented and undocumented, more access to higher education, New York will also have an increase in highly educated workers, which means more productivity. Also, the New York Dream Act of 2017 is not a route to providing legal residency for undocumented youth. In fact, not all undocumented youth would be affected by the New York Dream Act of 2017, since there, is, since there are certain requirements for eligibility. The New York Dream Act of 2017 eligibility requirements include attended a registered New York high school for, for two years or more, graduated from a registered New York City, New York um, high school, and applied for attendance at the Institution of Higher Education for Undergraduate stud stu uh, Studies for which an award is sought within five years of receiving a high school diploma, attended an approved program for a state high school equivalency diploma, received a diploma, and applied for attendance at the Institution of Higher Education for undergraduate studies, for which an award is sought within five years of receiving such diploma, or is otherwise eligible for the payment of tuition and fees at a rate no greater than that imposed for resident students of New York, <clears throat> of the State University of New York and CUNY, or community colleges. To help immigrant families prepare for high education expenses, the DREAM Act will also allow families to open a New York State 529 family tuition account under the New York State College Tuition Saving Programs. If they have an individual taxpayer identification number, estimate shows that roughly 4,500 4, undocumented students who graduate from New York High School every year, only 5 to 10 percent are able to pursue a college education because of financial burden. EIIC also supports the passage of the Bridge Act of 2017 at the federal level and urges Congress to provide qualifying DACA eligible individual provisional protected persons and employment authorization for three years. The Bridge Act of 2017 would offer provisional protected persons and employment authorization for three years to those who met the guidelines to apply for DACA. The Bridge Act would be a legislative shield against the unilateral revocation of DACA by the president and further protection from deportation. A new study shows that people who have DACA contribute 
to our economy and education growth. Further, it would ensure that these undocumented youths can continue to work, study, file income taxes, and be a productive member of society as long as they continue to meet the eligibility criteria. Thus, EINC urges the New York State Legislature to pass the New York Dream Act of 2017 and for the Governor Cuomo to sign the act, making the pursuit of a higher education for all students possible, regardless of one's immigration status. The EISC also urges Congress to pass the Bridge Act of 2017 to safeguard DACA holders and eligible applicants from deportation and encourage them to contribute to America's future prosperity. Thank you. Thank you for that, and and I think what you did was really lay out all the different pieces of this conversation and to the support for the Rezo and really understanding the, the intricate nature of the work that needs to happen and the, the, the kind of impact it's gonna have on our communities is vital. So thank you so much for, for being here and really thank thank you all. I don't know if you have any other comments to share with me today. We're gonna, we're gonna close it up now, but I wanna make sure that you all know um, from, and I'm just kind of looking at my notes here and looking uh, at all the new, the new textures of the dynamic nature of this administration, really thinking about the impact of high school students, for example, that are, um, that could be positively energized as they go through high school to know that there's gonna be an opportunity and a bridge to a college experience will actually change the dropout rates. I mean, that's, that's just, that, that's something that I think we, we kind of knew, but you really kind of created an opportunity and a narrative for us to talk about that and how this one, this one resolved state uh, opportunity that we can take can really transform our dropout rates and, and not only increase college uh, uh, acceptance rates from the dreamers, but actually solve something else that's happening in our communities, which is the dropout rates as well. So thank you so much for, for that. And really kind of think, thinking about how our legal services are really providing that, that change as, as the dynamics are changing, as we're seeing from, from your testimony, a real sense of, of new review for the renewals that's gonna really put ice on, uh, and I, I don't mean to use the word ice actually, which is gonna chill, have a chilling effect on our renewals and our new initial DACA applications that, that we still have the opportunity as of now. That could change tomorrow from this president, uh, but right now he knows that there's a, there's a real economic engine that we're all, that I think we're all uh, seeing and talking about. I don't know if you had another item to, to add. Um, just on the idea of sort of collecting the data in terms of if we're seeing more um, denials now, I think what is more so happening, at least in my practice, is that sort of borderline applications that we might have submitted before knowing that it could get denied but taking that risk isn't really happening anymore because we we see that a denial might lead to enforcement whereas before it wouldn't so some of the data might get skewed by the fact that we just wouldn't even submit the application to get denied in the first place so just to repeat what i heard the the denials in the prior administration meant something different from the denials in this current where someone's going to expose themselves to a government that will, that will potentially engage in, after paperwork has been created, a possible uh, enforcement action, a, right. a, a, a detainer and a removal. Right. Whereas they might have before just sort of turned a blind eye or not actively turned that case over to ICE or ICE may not have been actively looking for it because ICE and CIS will share information. It's just a question of who's kind of affirmatively going, going after the information. So whereas before we could rest assured that as long as it weren't sort of an issue of national security or a, something gang related that the, the person might be safe with a denial on record, now that's, that's not so much the case and we can't sort of encourage clients to apply if we think the risk is too high. Uh, and, and touching on on gang membership, um, which I, I briefly address in my written testimony, um, one of the other things that, that should be considered is statistically it is shown that um, if youth is not aimless and if they're part of something, if they have hope and opportunity, they are le least, less likely to fall prey um, to recruitment into gangs and, and to other forms of, of coercion and servitude um, to, to to savvy criminal predators who use the young um, um, and to do their bidding and who force them into this type of life. 
Um, so that's something that I think um, they, they, there's a lot of talk about gangs, but we should also think about how to avoid that and how to prevent that. And, and, and passage of this resolution and of the DREAM Act could absolutely um, nip that in the butter, at least really address it in a meaningful way. Um, and I think that's something that, that should be another factor to consider um, in, in, this, in this mission. Uh, yeah, and just uh, in relation to the, ri the rise of enforcement, I just, I think it's incredibly worrying the way the change enforcement priorities have really led to this enormous explosion in the way um, otherwise, uh, or previously uh, applicants who wouldn't, you know, have need to worry or have great need to worry, you know, suddenly it's a completely different world where previously President Obama and Pre uh, Secretary Johnson were very specific in their priorities about prioritization of national security and you know real public security threats um, in the order in the memorandum from November 2014 now with uh, Secretary Kelly's February uh, memo it's you know it is worryingly any crime that you convicted of and more worryingly any crime that you've been charged of but that case has not uh, been uh, resolved so you know it's as if undocumented immigrants have no right to innocent but guilty uh, innocent until proven guilty and this is where we find ourselves in so many ways. And so really my final thoughts as I close this hearing is the work ahead of us is tough. It's going to be tough. But tougher than the federal government is really our own commitment. And so thank you for sharing your personal stories. Um, my, my connection to this is also very personal, being the first in my family, coming from an immigrant family. Uh, I also experienced some of the same things, being the first in my family to go to college, but also growing up in an all-Spanish home. Uh, English was not my first language either. Head Start and preschool were the first places. The city is now engaging in a very massive operation to get young people, including our immigrant families, connected to that first taste of education and really building a network of community resources to bring the whole family up into education, not just our preschoolers, but our parents as well, to get them adult education classes. And that's where you heard earlier the $12 million that's coming in to make sure that our parents are learning English and our young people are learning English and the whole family can get education. And then where DACA comes in is really changing the way that, that our young people can actually get access to the economic engine of progress economic-wise, civic engagement-wise, really changing the fabric of our communities so people can feel connected and can come out of the shadows to really allow for democracy, which is under attack right now in a very real way by this administration, to be stronger. And it can be stronger in our neighborhoods, it can be stronger in our cities, and that's why I think we are, as a city, working with our administration, uh, the, the real vanguard right now against, and in our resistance against this federal government. as as the topic of today's hearing is on education as the equalizer, we need to figure out ways to, to remove the gaps of opportunities, not just to education, but to all services, and all of you really spoke to that. The last thing I wanna say is that, as we heard from today's testimony, uh, multiple testimonies, this, this is changing people's lives. And this is why we need to act, and this is why the Rezo will be passed from the city council uh, with massive enthusiasm and make sure that the state and the federal government do their work, but we're asking everyone to make their voices heard. If you have uh, opportunities to make that happen, talk to your local legislators, talk to your, to your federal and your state legislators to make sure that this year is a year that we pass uh, uh, the DREAM Act in both the Assembly and the, and the Senate and get it to the governor's desk to sign and make sure that we hold them accountable to make sure that the Bridge Act moves forward from New York State. New York State should be leading on this issue and this is an opportunity to do that. So everyone at home hearing this message, make your voices heard. Now is the time to make that happen and so I really encourage you um, to make that happen and also just thank you on the ground you're making this happen uh, if you're a legal service provider or part of a, a Manhattan Young Dems you're all part of this fabric of resistance and so I just can't thank you enough we need to grow our participation and that means everybody is involved and invited no matter your immigration status your gender sexual orientation your age no matter what if you're a New Yorker you have a voice and it matters and it's heard and it's being heard here at the City Council so I want to say thank you uh, to my staff uh, who helped make this happen and our council um, Indiana Porta for making making today 
today possible. And with that, I want to close this hearing on immigration, on uh, our for our dreamers, and our DACA, our, our, our DACA New Yorkers. Thank you.